Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Quantum Healing with Candace. I am your host, Candace Craw Goldman. This program was created to assist humans in this rapidly changing world, and its foundation is based upon the late great Dolores Cannon's work. So thank you, Dolores, for continuing to be here with us. And also thanks to Greg Prescott and Michelle Walling at In5D.com for making this show possible. And this beautiful flute music playing in the background, which I'm hoping to get maybe a little better, (laughs) better heard by you all, is courtesy of our dear friend and supporter of the show, Latita Teresa. And the title is Africanique. With humanity's new understanding and acceptance of the quantum world and the role that consciousness plays in shaping both our individual and collective reality, we have plenty of subject material. I am a full-time practitioner of Dolores' hypnosis method and had the honor and privilege of working with and alongside of her for several years. You can find out more about my practice at NewEarthJourney.com. And before we get started tonight, for those of you looking for a practitioner of Dolores' method, you may find these wonderful people at DoloresCannonQHHT.com. That's DoloresCannonQHHT.com. Also, if you would like to participate live on tonight's show, please call in the U.S. 646. 716-8890. That's 646-716-8890. And we'll try to answer as many calls as possible. Tonight is December 4th, 2015. And I'm very excited about this evening's show. About as excited as any show that I've ever done, actually. I'm I'm welcoming not only one, but two very special women to talk about Dolores Cannon tonight. Marilyn Dyke is a wonderful friend and a QHHT colleague who lives in Vancouver, Canada. I've had the great fortune to have worked with her in person and I'm honored to call Marilyn my personal friend. I've known her for many years. She was and is a fine voice, not only of wisdom, but of integrity in our shared group, which is Dolores Cannon's original worldwide support forum for practitioners of her method of quantum healing. Marilyn's lifelong curiosity compelled her to explore many different subjects. She found that information that couldn't be explained in the usual manner was much more interesting than other material. Unusual ideas and theories piqued her interest. And through this search for knowledge, She explored the unexplained, and along the way, she took an interest and practiced different healing modalities, including herbal medicine, flower essences, souls, and Reiki. And when she discovered Dolores Cannon's book, Convoluted Universe Book Two, in 2004, she knew she had finally found an author who was receiving answers to many of her questions. It was her interest in healing that convinced her to take Dolores Cannon's Past Life Progression Level 1 class in 2009. And she continued her studies with Dolores and became a Level 3 practitioner in 2013. Hi, Marilyn. Stand by while I introduce Tamara. Tamara McGillivray, McGillivray, I think is better pronounced, is a professional astrologer and symbolist. And I don't even know what a symbolist is. Tamara, you're going to have to let me know who uses a variety of energy techniques to help her clients uncover 
their potential and interact with the universe in a way that manifests their highest good in this life and place. She holds a BA in East-West traditions and ancient religions and astrology. She's a yoga teacher, a meditation coach, a Reiki master. She studied with Dolores Cannon as a QHHT practitioner, and she is certified level two. She is a professional astrologer. She's also a teacher and board member of Kepler College and the past president of the local San Diego chapter of the National Council of Geocosmic Research. That's pretty interesting, too. I don't even know what that is. She'll have to let us know. She writes a monthly astro column for an online Canadian magazine, and she's the owner of Silver Disc Consulting, which is dedicated to connecting ancient wisdom to the modern world through speaking engagements, workshops, one-on-one consultations, and also a weekly blog. As a lifelong learner and teacher, she opens up new perspectives for herself and others through her work with a variety of energy techniques. Marilyn and Tamara and I will be taking an in-depth look at QHHT founder, author, and teacher Dolores Cannon's astrology chart. Tamara has discovered some very rare and unique connections between Dolores' chart and another very well-known figure that may help us to understand the very big and real topics of time and timelessness. So without further ado, I want to welcome both Marilyn and Tamara to the show. Welcome, ladies, to the show. Thank you. (laughs) Yes, thank you. (laughs) I'm so excited to have you here. I'm also so excited that our Skype connection is working. Yay, all of you people out there who put the white pyramid of light around the technology to make this happen. Marilyn, I'd like to start out by asking you, how did you and Tamara meet, and how long have you been friends? Well, I think we've been friends about 20 years, and uh, really, Tamara and I met when I was first really seriously uh, looking into spirituality, metaphysics, and I remember I was in a bookstore, and she was uh, one of the people there who was doing classes and but also helping out. I think it was a Saturday and and so she literally followed me around and was talking about I don't know, wolves, the different colors of wolves, I don't know. But anyway, she literally followed me around. And then um finally, uh, you know, I uh, we talked some more and I found out she was teaching some classes. I was interested in, and then yeah, we, I took some classes, we um, worked together a lot with Reiki, and have just been, you know, she is my my rock, my go-to person for information, and is also a great motivator for me, <laughs> and I, I couldn't, I wouldn't want to be in this life, as I said before, without Tamara, I think that was probably one of the uh, the points that in your sticking points I made, I had to be here with Tamara. She's a, oh, a lovely sweet, <laughs> and, and yeah, just just I'm so pleased to have her as a friend. As am I, Marilyn. That's a very <laughs> sweet uh, introduction of our friendship. Yes, we've been friends forever, and uh, have done many many things together, including our QHHT training. We did that together even. Marilyn Marilyn insisted <laughs> that we did it together. <laughs> now, now, where did you all take that class? I was in Fayetteville. Yes, it was. So you and both traveled in. We did, yeah. Yeah. I, came, From- I went down for a visit uh, to San Diego, and then now, uh, no, I think we met in uh Dallas, and then we traveled over to Fayetteville, didn't we? Yeah, that's and then correct. To your place, yeah, and we practiced. Yeah. <laughs> now, ladies, I have to ask you this: Was that in the summer? Was that a summertime class? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yep. You know, April. April. Oh. oh okay. I I see. Um, I was there for the summertime um classes, but I I don't think it was April. But okay. Well, anyway, I'm so happy to have you both here. I think you were, Candace. Really? 
I don't remember you, but I remember Dolores at the end of the class said, now listen, we don't hang you up to dry. <laughs> remember she used to say that. Yeah. And she says, we've got this, uh, you know, this person has, has set up this whole uh, form and where you can ask questions. Yeah, that was the old Yahoo form. It and sure I was. you were there at the back of the class. You might not have been there for the whole class. I yeah, think. no, she. Yeah, she didn't. She didn't let me stay for the whole class that quickly. I had to prove my. <laughs> I had to have a year or two to prove myself. But thank you for for that lovely, that lovely memory. And and Tamara and Marilyn and I are part of this amazing worldwide community of other practitioners, and we've been sharing you know, hundreds, if not thousands of stories and concepts and ideas now for, um, well, gosh, for for seven years. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it would be seven years. Yeah, <laughs> it's been quite a while. Well, let's just jump right into all of this, shall we? You know, the first thing I'd like to ask is, um, you know, all I know, Marilyn, is you you said, how about we do a show like this? So how did the idea come to you? Um, I think uh, because I, this is years ago, I got uh, Dolores's, somebody on the forum, I think, actually posted Dolores' birth information. And I, I looked up her chart and I thought, oh, well, that's interesting, you know. And then, but I'm not for sure it was the right information. And then recently I looked again and I thought, holy cow, she's an eighth house sun sign. Isn't that, because I'm an eighth house sun, sun sign. And then I started, uh, you know, I was talking a little bit to Tamara on that. And then you asked me if I'd like to be on. And I don't know, you know, I, I was looking for ideas that would be interesting. And then I, maybe it was Dolores, but. For whatever reason, I thought, wow, wouldn't it be fun to have Tamara on talking about Dolores' uh, chart? And then that's when I uh, we got your um, your uh, birth information. And I said to Tamara, Tamara, and I think I said to you too, wouldn't it be a hoot if Candace had an 8,000 sun sign? And there you are. You know, I need to ask that. I know that Tamara wasn't quite ready to talk about this quite yet, but, I mean, is that, I mean, how many sun signs are there? I mean, is the odds really, really high for that then? 12, and I don't know what the odds are. Maybe Tamara could still listen. Okay, so so we have to kind of step back just a little tiny bit to, to be able to talk about the houses because that's kind of where you get into more advanced. So what we need to know, first of all, is that when we're looking at an astrology chart, we're looking at it on a 2D piece of paper, or like it's a 2D piece of paper, you've got this print on it, and you've flattened out the night sky on this piece of paper. And astrology is a symbolic language. So when you're talking about um, me being able to uh, read and interpret um, symbols and symbology, that's really what we're doing. It's like... Uh, whether you're looking at the mandala of the uh, chart or whether you're looking at dream, you know, interpretation, it's all a symbolic interpretation. So the chart itself is like taking a snapshot of the sky at the moment of the person's birth and putting it it out on this piece of paper so that we can symbolically glean information about ourselves uh, you know, this, it, really for further growth. We we want to look at this. It's nice to have all this information, but what do you do with it? Well, there's skilled and unskilled behavior. So as you are symbolically interpreting the information, getting deeper into aspects of your psyche, you can then look at skilled and unskilled behavior and hopefully bring that into your day-to-day existence and work with that. So looking at the moment of your birth, the the um, sign on the horizon is called your uh, rising sign, your ascendant sign. So that's like if you were looking at the horizon, it, there's obviously this big mathematical calculation that happens, but we'll say, you know, you're standing out there, you're looking out the window at the moment of your birth, and this sign is on there. And the sign is the script. It's it's planets 
are utilizing as their script, how they're functioning. So, you know, you have an actor and this actor's given this script and they have to try to act out their part with this script. And the script tells us all kinds of things about behaviors that are going to come up with, you know, with each of the planets. So then we divide it into all of these houses. We now have this starting point where we can do 12 houses and the 12 houses um, represent different areas of our life. And what you guys are talking about is the eighth house. Um, and that is the house of mysteries. <laughs> it's the, yeah, it's the house of, <laughs> it's, it's actually the house of death as well. And, um, and some say rebirth. Um, so it's, it's exactly what you're doing in QHHT. You're looking at, you're going sort of between the veil, looking at uh, punching a hole in time and going back into lives and um and gleaning information from those lives looking at death and uh and you know interpreting that and and um symbolically gaining information that helps you live a better life so that having uh prominent planets not just the sun sign but also the moon sign Dolores actually has bo- had both of her sun and the moon sign of the day of her birth you know this this day that she had was where they were both in Aries, so they were both utilizing the Aries script, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but they were both in the eighth house of uh, mysteries. And I, I don't know if I'm getting off topic here right away, but I'm just I have a question <laughs> about her moon because yes. it's near degrees, it's right on yes. the house. So she could have very easily been a Pisces moon, and I, I'm just you know, knowing her a little bit that I know her, and I, you can kind of probably be able to add a lot more. I wonder what you know how she would have been different as a Pisces moon. Uh, well, it would it would have been very different actually, and I did because you know because we we don't have her time on a birth certificate. Her time is from memory. Um, and it's actually on Astro dot, uh, the Astro Data Bank on Astro dot com, um, where I confirmed time because you had um, found this birth uh, birth time on I think on on one of the um, forums, and I wanted to make sure that we did have the right birth time, and it is the one that's listed there that Dolores has given somebody from memory. So it's like her mother remembered that you know the time, or an aunt remembered the time. And this is the time that we've um, we've gone with, um, and so I did move her time back and forth to see if that moon would switch. But that whole day, uh, it is an Aries moon, so we know that no matter what, even if we move the chart to um, you know two thirty or one thirty or you know different times, that we're still getting this really strong, powerful um, Aries moon. And I think that Dolores had to have the sun and the moon both in Aries to be able to do the work that she did. I think if it was a Pisces moon, um, uh, maybe it, she wouldn't have been as focused. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. You know, the Aries, the Aries moon and the Aries sun really tells us that she was a pioneer in her field. That's, you know, it's, uh, it's a cardinal fire uh, sign. Uh, Aries, and it's very much about um, you know being a being the the groundbreaker, being the one leading the pack, and yeah. that's exactly what she did. So I think that's why she had to have both the sun and the moon in Aries. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's good to know that she's that solid in her yep. um, sign. Good. Yep. Yep. For sure. And zero, actually, that's a really good point too, is that yeah, she has a zero degree. Um, Aries moon so and this is like the very beginning of all the signs Aries is the first sign in the zodiac it's the sign of spring it's the first one starting the pack it's it's like the warrior that rushes to the battlefield and starts cutting heads off and you know doing their duty uh, to forge ahead and, and win the battle um, without thinking, you know, they just jump in both feet and, you know, what happens, happens. And at zero, zero degrees, it's like, I don't know if you um, know the tarot cards, but you could um, utilize the fool card 
as a zero degree Aries moon. It's like, you know, when they just step off that cliff, just knowing they're going to be okay, just knowing that there's going to be something there to catch them. They have to have that fearlessness of just jumping into the the thick of it and knowing they'll be okay. And that's that's what she did. Well, if there is any way of describing Dolores Cannon, it is fearless. You bet. Fearless, yeah. I yeah. second, third that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure. yeah, so that that's the first thing that jumps out. And, and the thing about um, you have a, a, you know, eighth house, um, packed eighth house, uh, you know, and, and Candace has uh, planets in the eighth house, and we've looked at other charts that have, uh, planets in the eighth house. It doesn't mean that you have to have a whole bunch of planets in the eighth house to do QHHT for sure. But what it does mean is that there is some sort of thread, some sort of connection between the work that you're doing and this eighth house. Um, you know, which I mean, it makes sense. You know, it is the house of mysteries. It's the house of death. So, you know, it it uh, does make sense. But to really be able to give that signature, you know, I'd have to look at, you know, a, a couple of hundred charts to know for sure if, you know, if the majority of QHHT practitioners actually have eight house, you know, have the eight house um, planets. Well, to me, it made sense because uh, of the curiosity. Yes. The will dig deep, you know, and yeah, uh, that yeah. I see. Myself and definitely Dolores. I mean, you know, the master questioner. She, she mm-hmm. just has more curiosity than anybody else I ever know. <laughs> you know. And that's really um, Aries has that sense of curiosity. That's what drives them forward. That's what takes them to the head of the head of the pack to forge ahead. Is that they have this intense curiosity and they have the fire, the passion to um, to follow the quest. Yeah, and the fearless, like you said, and, uh, you know, Aries people are so much fun to be around, aren't they? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. Thinking up something new to do. There is never a moment when they can't find something fun to do. So, mm-hmm. yeah, very Absolutely. And I know that Candace had a question about um, uh, the connection to the female goddess that Dolores um, also had. You know, so where where do our connections to our feminine and our masculine uh, come into the to the chart? Now she has a very heavy masculine signature with this stellium. She's got what's called a stellium in the eighth house, which means that there's three planets in the um, in the eighth house in Aries, and her north node is there as well. We'll talk about the nodes in a minute. Um, but um, so she has this real masculinity, which probably, you know, in her time period, like knowing when she was born and, um, you know, the sort of the male uh, being dominant at that time, that if you were a woman and you were doing you were you know, ground doing groundbreaking work, you certainly had to be strong. And that's where she got her strength from and that masculine energy that made her fit in to you know, to um, to the you know to when to the sort of masculine uh, era, um, but Dolores has a very very beautiful Venus in her chart. It's her Venus is in Pisces, and for astrologers, anybody who's an astrologer out there, her Venus is exalted. When a planet is exalted, she actually has several exalted planets. You know, we we shouldn't be surprised. She has several exalted planets. An exalted planet is when it is in a position of power, but it's a special kind of power. When a planet is in rulership, when it's ruling its own sign, when it's really powerful that way, it can be it can be a ruler. It can be a nice ruler. You know, we have nice rulers, and we also have dictators. You know, it can be like the bad boy. You know, cutting heads off and putting their feet up on their desk and drinking beer and you know being badly behaved. But when they're exalted, it's like a king is visiting another country. He's still a king. You know, he still has that prominence of a king, and every you know he's got all of his people around him doing all the things they need to do and he's got his soldiers with him making sure he's okay but he's in somebody else's kingdom so he's actually going to be better behaved so exalted planets 
they say classically um, that they are better behaved than and stronger in most cases than um, planets that are in rulership. So her Venus was exalted, and that is very, very ultra feminine. Uh, and uh, really would give her that connection to the goddess. Uh, it's also in her seventh house, and the seventh house is about our relationship. It's our house of mirrors is really what I like to call it. It's where we surround ourselves with people that mirror back to us this energy that we're trying to learn, this energy that we're trying to um, embrace in ourselves. So she would uh, surround herself with, you know, many goddesses, which, you know, you could see in her classes. She had many goddesses that would uh, come to her class. And um, and this would be her mirror in how she would grow and understand her own femininity and embrace that. Hmm. So I just thought that was really interesting when you had asked about her masculine feminine energy and how that might show up. That's really, that is interesting because her presentation was, you know, she was an imposing woman. She was not very delicate at all. Um, mm-hmm. She she would walk into a room and uh, just take command. She wasn't small either. You know, physically she wasn't small, and her her voice was deep. And um, you know, again, she wasn't delicate. But how interesting is that? That you know, there's that there's the play, and then um, then the connection with the divine feminine, which we all know is what's, you know, coming back into um, into our world right now and into our time. But I would like to, to mention here uh, her hands. Have, did, have you ever looked at her hands? And she used them, you know, you could see them. She had the most beautiful hands, very delicate fingers. For And I always, they always captured my attention. Yes. And I was watching her. Yes. And I wonder if somehow that has something to do with it. You know, and that's how her beauty, well, uh, her beauty uh, in one physical way uh, really shone through. Gosh, Marilyn, what a beautiful observation. I, I've i never heard anyone actually say that out loud, even though I've noticed it myself. I mean, some of the most compelling photographs of Dolores and her most compelling gestures are when she would bring her hands to her face. Yeah, yeah. And... Uh, I don't know. I notice hands. I don't know why, but I do. I don't. I don't know if Tamara does, but I've always noticed that she's got uh, a person who has a thin uh, fingertips is a very sensitive person. This is how you. Re- I don't know much about reading hands, but this is the one thing I know that notes a, a very person is very sensitive. Hmm. So, in even though she said she always said she wasn't psychic or, you know, anything like that, I believe that maybe she was receiving (laughs) more information than what she's telling us. You bet. Yes, and actually talking about her uh, Venus could bring us to her Mercury. Um, The one thing that I always noticed about um, Dolores was, you know, when she was doing the regression work, that beautiful, soft, melodic voice that she used, well, her Mercury, how Mercury is how we communicate, not what we communicate, but how the the tool that we have to communicate, uh, which you know, in one one of those tools is our voice. Another one would be writing, that kind of thing. Um, was in Taurus, and Taurus is ruled by this beautiful, exalted Venus that she has. So that, to me, that's that I kind of made that connection to her voice. With um, with this beautiful Venus, yeah, that's so true. Wow, that's a good one, uh, Tam. I didn't even notice that but <laughs> on that one. <laughs> okay, I'm here, Tam. Did we lose Tam? Oh no, sorry, okay. I was I was muted. Oh, that's so. <laughs> so the the um, chart helps us unfold information about ourselves to allow us to kind of dig a little deeper like how why do we tick this way how do we tick this way it's not it's we can't use it as an excuse because you know skilled unskilled behavior there is no excuse for unskilled behavior i mean it, it happens we all have unskilled behavior from time to time but once you recognize like what 
the skill could be, then you can tap into that a little more frequently. So um, this exalted, these exalted planets that she had, she she had a couple other planets that were also exalted. Uh, would they they helped her be um, skilled because the exalted planets are a little easier to work with, like her Venus. You know how you Venus is um, one of those planets that uh, is a part of our physical body in the sense of magnetizing ourselves. So you know when you meet those people and they have that magnetic quality and you're like oh you know you really like you want to be around them or you're attracted to them and you you know they're special in some way because I mean we're all special but um, it's just in how we magnetize our uh, physical the physical uh, feature of our self um, so it's the Mars is how we go out and get things that we need. It's that part of the, it's the push-pull of the magnetization. She had a very powerful Mars. Her Mars was in Leo, which is ruled by the sun. Very, very powerful. And this beautiful, soft Venus that was in Pisces. And this push-pull of these two energetic sides of her nature on how she went out and got what she wanted and how she would draw towards herself what she needed. So... Very beautiful. So I guess we'll just continue along with her um, with her chart here on some of the things that I boast um, about her. Um, she ha- so I'm, I've talked about her having this exalted planet. Her sun in Aries was also exalted. So it also has had this sort of special quality that she would be able to tap into. Obviously, you know, we're not born skilled. These are skills that we have to grow with and and learn how to utilize. But her um, son, the spirit, was very, very powerful in her chart as well, as well as her exalted Jupiter. Jupiter is a really beautiful planet when it's functioning well, you know, when it's skilled. Um, Her Jupiter was in Cancer. And Jupiter is about opportunities and growth and wisdom. Um, Hers was very powerful. It sat with a very powerful player that we're going to talk uh, about a lot with um, Dolores because I think it was a very integral part of her personality. And her Jupiter sat with her Pluto. And I think we've all probably heard the word Pluto. And I think if you haven't, uh, well, if you have heard the word Pluto, then you kind of shake a little bit. You're like, oh, do we need to go there? Do we need to talk about Pluto? Pluto has this uh, beautiful side to it as well as uh, as this really difficult side. But her exalted Jupiter sat with this Pluto and, and you know, would help and support this Pluto considerably. Um, her Mars was in Leo. That was another beautiful part of her chart. And... Um, her, we look at what's called a dispositor tree. It it takes all of the parts of the psyche and it looks at how they support each other and whether they support each other. Sometimes the psyche is well supported. Sometimes it struggles a little bit with, um, you know, with these weird loops that it's got to go through and it has to kind of ask every aspect of the person's psyche before it moves forward and does things. And sometimes it has these dictators running it that are just running the show and and creating havoc. In her particular case, she had this beautiful mutual reception. And a mutual reception is when two planets are in each other's sign and they support each other. And her whole chart was supported by her Mars, her ability to go out and get what she needed and, and do what she needed to do, action things she needed to action, and this sun. And remember that the sun... Is uh, now we'll get a little bit into the to the QHHT stuff as to how her chart fits so well in the work that she did. Uh, the sun is um, it's it's our solar energy. It's um, connected to the greater self, to the greater being, to the observer self. So this part of herself of Dolores, why she was so um, good at what she did and and did so well you know with what she did in the business and and uh, the teaching that she did was because I believe of this this Mars um, Sun connection of this mutual reception that they had the support they had for each other so when she uh, would become and the Sun is also our consciousness by the way it's our the moon is our subconscious and the Sun is our conscious 
behavior. So this is part of what she did, bringing the conscious awareness into um, the, this moment in time, into a functioning part of the of the person that she was working with to be doing the healing. So I thought this was a really significant um, foundational energy that she carried in her chart that really explained the work that she did. And I think that was another reason, Marilyn, why her moon was also in Aries, because it, um, you know, the subconscious, it's bringing the con- the subconscious into the conscious, you know, like having that moment of uh, becoming conscious of what the subconscious is doing and and whether it is supporting us or whether it's holding us back from things that we're trying to accomplish in this life. Okay, well, I I agree with you, and I look at that, and I think you know, subconscious, conscious mind, or conscious mind, and yeah, and the subconscious are in balance. When they I look are, at- yeah. yeah, yeah, and then she has this really. I talked a little bit about the stellium, about this um, Uranus. Uh, well, the stellium, the it's the it's the sun, Uranus and the moon that are all in Aries. And it's called a stellium. It's like a little pack of energy that um, is all like focused on one thing. And of course, it's the eighth house. It's the mysteries that she was focused on. But the Uranus, the planet itself, is about our higher uh, mental capacity. It's our observer self. It's um, our genius. The Mercury is our lower mind. And the Uranus is our higher mind. And I thought, wow, how apropos is her son conjunct this Uranus uh, in the eighth house? Because that's exactly where she took this. It's bringing the the observer self, bringing the the uh, the genius aspect of ourself into our conscious mind to be able to have a conversation. Mm. Well, not only that, I mean, the woman had a mind like a steel trap. (laughs) Yes. You know, I would love to be able to bring up details of of sessions that she could, you know, she just rattle on. I think she could go on for hours. True, Candace? She she really could. I have this I have this particular memory where somebody was asking her, and I don't even remember what the question was because if the question didn't matter, it was the way she answered the question that mattered. Somebody asked a very detailed question about something, and Dolores stopped for a moment, and she literally said something along the lines of, um, "The answer to that question is in Convoluted Universe, page one, you know, two, page one ninety three, or something like that." I mean, she actually pulled out a page number of where somebody should go, and maybe it was because she'd referenced it before or something. But it was just astonishing to me. She could just do that, and she did it all the time. I mean, she just she just rattled that off all the time. And and what was so interesting to me too was that she would do this, this sort of uh, uh, presentation of an an encyclopedic mind. She would do that on stage. And yet when you were with her in a casual situation, um, you know, walking to and from class or having a bite to eat or whatever, she wasn't like that. Um, She kind of, uh, she talked about the weather. You know, she talked about food. It was just very, she was a very interesting woman in that way. Actually, that was a um, something that uh, you had uh, mentioned to me before, too. So I wanted to see where that was in the chart. And I really believe that that was the higher mind and the lower mind work. When she was on stage, that was the higher mind, the Uranus, that would would, uh, streamline, just stream information to her. And when you were with her in person and you were having lunch or going for a coffee, that was the lower mind. That's the Mercury. The Mercury was in Taurus. Taurus loves food. It loves, um, you know, to just talk about everyday things. It's a very down-to-earth, you know, aspect to uh to having a mercury and also it's kind of slows everything down so the fast pace of the aries gets slowed down into this really more methodical thinking well that brings to mind when uh, when 
we were doing the level three, uh, Candace, you remember, I mean, this just shocked me because I'd never been in a small group with Dolores before, but I mean, not only was she, you know, like as, you know, the higher mind and the lower mind, she could flip back and forth and she was, it was like she was constantly running both, I would, I would think, because, mm-hmm. and, you know, she, not only was she trying to teach us and critique our, our videos and whatnot, but she was also worried about, well, it, are you too warm? Are you too cold? Uh, what are the snacks like? Have you got enough, you know, are you, know, are you sure you're okay? <laughs> you know, she was so concerned about us. Yeah, uh, that's it, the Venus talking. Yeah. Oh, the Venus, okay, yeah. So she could just, uh, yeah. Just out of the blue, she'd be, her mind would be off into um, just very everyday mundane uh, matters concerning whether we were all feeling okay or, or whatever. It was quite interesting to see her like that. Mm-hmm. So just kind of diving a little bit deeper into her chart again here. Um so she's, I mentioned briefly about the North Node also in this, uh, included in this eighth house. It's in this helium. It's actually one degree conjunct this Uranus. And the North Node is pointing us towards growth. It's where we're trying to get to. Where we're coming from, there's another point in the chart directly across, obviously, from that, which is called the South Node. The South Node is where we come from, and some say that's our past lives, and that's how we connect to our past life, and past life information is through the South Node. So we can see that growth um, into the new way of being, uh, this new healing technique, this new uh, way of talking to our higher mind. Uh, was something that she was completely focused on. So this North Node, which is a very integral part in our chart, was part of this stellium. So that was pretty exciting when I saw that there as well. Yeah. Also, uh, it's retrograde. So does that have any... They're all all retrograde. Oh, all they? nodes. Okay. Yeah, the nodes move. The, move. the nodes actually move the opposite direction to the planets. So, right. but there's... yeah. They're very slow moving, though. They take 30 years to move around the chart. Um, And she was a very nodal person in the sense that when I looked at future events that happened uh, in Dolores' life, the nodes were often involved. So um, this this node being so integral in this eighth house and in this stellium, the nodes were very active. So, you know, um, the karmic aspect of it. Uh, you know, dealing with karma, dealing with people getting caught up in karma, um, dealing with growth, you know, forward and letting go of past. This was very, very much a part of her life. And it shows very, very much in her chart as as being very integral to that experience. Well, isn't that interesting? Because, of course, it, you know, until the latter part of her teaching and, and life. I mean, she she was um, known for Dolores Cannon's method of past life regression. And she talked about karma, you know, all the way up until till the end. Of course, towards the end, she was talking about the, the, the fact that, you know, much of karma and the concept of karma is being released and everything. But how interesting is that? I mean, she made her whole life's work about that. Yeah, I, I thought it was incredibly fascinating that it was so interesting. Sometimes the nodes are really active in somebody's chart, and sometimes they're not. And for her, it, it they're just they're embedded in everything she did. It was you know revolving around these nodes. The other thing was the Pluto. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about her Pluto because it is um, in. Uh, it kind of leads into other things that we're going to talk about. Pluto is. Our it's it's um it's a very collective planet. It's very very slow moving. So lots of us, you know, share the same. It has all of our you know Pluto will have the same script for, um, you know, a whole generation. It's a generational planet where it shows up in the chart is individual, obviously, and the connections it makes to other planets is very personal. So the the Pluto itself represents power and control. It represents the ego. 
And I know one thought uh, one thought that you had was how was she able to separate herself from um, you know from uh, uh, negativity or you know uh, all the things that she was experienced you know experienced in the work that she did because there would be um, depression and darkness that would you know that people she's trying to deal with other people and how do you deal with all that I really feel that her Pluto being so connected to this really really fantastic Jupiter certainly helped um, helped her with uh, the Jupiter's exalted remember so he's in he's in special um, he has a special strength that he carries and um, so it's like how do you separate yourself from ego, like from becoming egotistical or having ego, you know, kind of hanging over your head? Uh, the thing about Pluto is that you have to let go of your ego in order to ha- gain true power. That's the deal. So as soon as you can let go of your ego, then the whole world opens up to you. And you know, the work that she did, obviously you have to let go of the ego just in the work, let alone all of the accolades that come with that. You know, all the people that uh, want to meet you and want to, you know, be close to you and want to learn from you and all that kind of stuff. But that aside, just the work that she did, the the method that she developed is letting go of the ego. So this Pluto was so integral in her learning about letting go of the ego that when you let go of ego when you let go of control then you have all the control you desire because we know that it's in your reaction to your environment you can't change your environment all you can change is how you uh, interact with your environment how you deal with your environment uh, and how you behave you know within that environment for yourself you can't change the actual environment that you're in so I just thought, and also as we develop um, some of this storyline, as we start taking this a little bit further and looking at her chart with um, Nostradamus's chart, uh, we're going to see that this Pluto is very, very integral to her relationship with him as well. Hmm. Yeah. You know, she when she would teach and she would talk about um, the relationship that a facilitator would uh, create with a client, she was masterful at that moment of really um, exemplifying that that the story and the energy and the spotlight, of course, should always be on the client. And there are, you know, some who would take the class that would need to be reminded of that, <laughs> you know, maybe a little bit more often. But when Dolores herself, when she was, The facilitator, I mean, all attention, all focus, all energy was on the client. And she completely set her ego aside uh, doing that work. And, you know, think about the thousands and thousands and thousands of sessions that she did um, that way over all of these years, um, you know, where she really did. She, she She had to set that aside to sit in those sessions and allow that information to come forth like that. So that's really interesting. It is. It it is uh, very, very interesting. And it was something I wanted to, you know, kind of dive into and look at in her chart. Um, The, her Pluto is actually in an exact opposition. So it stands exactly across from the Saturn in her chart. This is not an easy, I'm not talking easy peasy. This, 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 you know, letting go of the ego. It wasn't like she snapped her fingers. Oh, I've got an exalted planet, and all oh, all of it. Uh, uh-uh. uh. This is work that she had to do on herself mm-hmm. in order to get to that state. And this Saturn. Saturn is about boundaries and limitations, uh, structure, and um, you know how she has this very structured way of doing the work that she did, mm-hmm. and it's in that structure that. Uh, she embraced because her Saturn is actually very powerful. It's in a it's in a really powerful sign. It's in its rulership, which means that it could be a dictator, right? Or it could be a uh, a, a nice ruler, you know, like you know, uh, like a great king, or or it could be a troublesome king. And across from this Pluto, holy mackerel, that could be a really really tough tough thing to deal with. But she was able to take this energy signature, which is very stressful, to uh, the skilled level 
and utilize it, like you said, thousands and thousands of times where she was able to take this to the next level. Um, and I think that, you know, the support of the chart, the support of the Venus in the seventh house, the support of having this really strong sun and uh, powerful moon, um, you know, and the eighth house uh, things that she had would have supported that. But it didn't mean that, that Dolores didn't do work. Dolores had to work very hard in order to uh, be skilled with this kind of energy. I think she really did work hard. You know, when you think about it, and this may be kind of reaching back to something that you've already said, but about how she made things happen. I mean, this was the woman who, you know, wrote these books and shopped them around, at, you know, to publishers and then got pink slip after pink slip after pink slip. I mean, she was so determined and so focused and so strong. And then, you know, and then just flat created her own publishing house to publish her own books, you know, so she just, she was not going to be denied. I think that uh, describes her perfectly because she worked, I got to say, 24 <laughs> seven her entire life on this project. And what was the project? The project was really ultimately the shift in consciousness. I mean, you know, every moment, even while watching TV, she'd be um, reading through transcripts and, and, and working constantly. And she had such energy, didn't she, Marilyn? I mean, there, you know, last couple of years when we would be working with her, you know, we'd have class after class and days after days of classes and and we would have dinner and then the rest of us people who were, you know, decades younger than her would go fall asleep in our beds and she'd go up to her hotel room and start writing. I yeah. mean, it was just astonishing. And she did that all the way up till the end. Yeah. And, and just, and I can see what Tamara's saying about with the, um, with the Saturn too being in Capricorn. Oh, yeah. she, she, she would, she would be like a bulldog. She would not let go. If there was something that needed to be done or, or said or whatever it was, she would go there. Even if she didn't um, emotionally herself, you know, she felt sometimes she may have felt a little hesitant to do that, but she would do it nonetheless in order to further the what I call the project, the, the you know, in the bigger picture. Yeah, absolutely. And and you can like I said it that's not that it's easy. This opposition is actually quite uh quite difficult and it is tied into this really powerful sun that she had. And in astrology we call it a T square and it it doesn't sound pretty, does it? It's not like <laughs> some real foo-foo name. It's like it's you know planets that are struggling to work together in order to better a cause, in order to better the person, in order to um, get a job done. And that's exactly what they're, you know, what they do. So sometimes the harder things we see in our chart actually are the things that bring the biggest gift. Because once we can master them, once we can um, become skilled in those energies, we can do great things. And we know that Dolores did. So it, uh, we're grateful that she did all that work on herself. Yeah, um, when you look at it, yeah, maybe it wasn't easy, but boy, she had what she needed, didn't she? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, you know, that comes to, uh, I know that you talk about detail, and we're like, where's the detail in her chart? Actually, um, her ascendant, what was on the horizon at the moment of her birth, um, was Virgo. And uh, this Virgo is, it's like, um, think about sand, it's mutable earth. Uh, so, you know, counting all those tiny grains of sand, keeping them all in order, um, you know, keeping everything organized. That was the ascendant. That was what was on our horizon. And that's what you saw was this really incredibly organized person that uh, was able to pull everything together, that was able to provide um, this, you know, the classes and teaching and, uh, and do all those thousands and thousands of, uh, of clients. Uh, and and along with that was her Neptune. So you know we we this is a very collective planet, 
but what's so special about this Neptune is its position on the horizon. It sits on the horizon. And um, it this is really what gave her, I'll say, the connection to the collective that was so, so powerful in her life. Um, that's really where it comes from. The other thing about this Neptune is that it's relatively unaspected. It actually is only unaspected by uh, what we call a quincunx, which is um, a very obscure connection to the chart, very, very little connection to the chart. Sometimes when we have these planets that have very little connection to, well, has no connection to the personal planets, like the personal aspect of the psyche we function in the physical body with it had no connection to that at all and i and what we have to think about there is um that it was untethered so it really her 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 connection to the collective was was untethered by her earthly body hmm. and and i think that uh you know shows itself quite well in her life as well hmm. Yeah, very, very interesting stuff. So we could move on to a little bit of her um, transit. I did want to talk a little tiny bit about some transit things. Um, And when we look at a transit chart, it's really taking a point in time, and it overlays the chart, and we look to see what's lit up. So it's always about the natal chart. The You know, transits happen every day. Things happen every day that light everybody's charts up. But um, it's what, what lights your chart up, what lights Dolores's chart up. What happens is these planets, it's like your environment, your external environment is lighting something up inside, in, and then that's having some sort of consequence, good or bad or, you know, Um, moving forward, that kind of thing. Um, And she had some very significant ones. And again, uh, I had talked about the nodal nodal connections when she had big things happen in her life in 1968. What happened in 68? Ah, yes, she she became involved in hypnosis in 1968. She actually had a nodal return. So these planets, once you're born, they continue, you know, moving on their merry way. They go around the chart. Some whip around, you know, the moon whips around every month. The sun whips around once a year, right? Your solar return is literally your birthday. Um, And then you have planets like the nodes and Saturn that take 30 years to move around the chart, 30 years to return to their birth spot. And at the return of her nodes to their birth spot, to when, you know, the moment of her birth, uh, was when she became involved in how enlightening is that? How, like, the nodes are like, come on, we need to get moving in this direction. So they lit up her chart so that she would uh, become engaged in this new thing that she was doing, this hypnosis. I thought that was absolutely fascinating. Um, In 78, uh, I have listed that in 79, she started exclusively working with past life therapy and regression work. In 78, the end of 1978, her Saturn, remember that planet of boundaries and limitations and structure? He's a good guy as well as, you know, he can he can throw some curveballs. But really what he's there to do is help you structure your life in order to accomplish the things you want to accomplish. Well, that dude went over her Neptune, that collective point that I was telling you about, the one that's kind of untethered and a little bit difficult to rein in. All of a sudden, this Saturn, this planet of of um, a structure, of creating boundaries around her, this collectiveness that was around her, this chaos, bringing it into a format that she could utilize and understand. Well, a year later, six months later, she starts working exclusively with past life therapy. One of the things that Saturn does when it hits that um, Neptune is it's, um, it's like uh, lighting a fire under someone's behind to say get your butt in gear here's a goal we need to make this goal how are we going to accomplish it it's a do or die almost in in person's life where um they feel like they're really driven to accomplish something 
and they become almost frenzied in order to accomplish it. So I'm sure that year between 78 and 79, when she really went into exclusive past life therapy, she was going through this transition of, I need to change the work I'm doing. It needs to be deeper and I need to bring that collective. I, well, for her, it was exploring the collective, really, this, uh, this Neptune energy. And, in, um, and then uh, in 1986, we had another point, uh, August of 86, the North Node transited her son. And this was when she expanded her investigations into the UFO field. I thought it was absolutely fascinating because here's that Uranus again. Um, you know, Uranus uh, can be like a lightning strike as well. You know, it's like the genius in us, right, that f- comes to surface. Um, here, here the uh, node transits, you know, that eighth house and starts to spark her thoughts about UFO and, uh, and doing studies in suspected UFO landings and, and such. So you can really see how, um, you know, the nodes were very, very active in her life uh, and very significant because as we move into the next topic, um, those nodes are going to show up again. So before I move into those, into the next topic, which is about Dolores and Nostradamus, did you guys have any questions or thoughts about that? Um, I would say, you know, right on at 86, you know, when she uh, went into the UFO information, I don't think she was, she went, you know, jumped in with both feet right away. But you can see how, uh, it, it, you know, I don't know, but I can picture it being like almost overnight for going from, well, not too much interest to, boom, she was right into it. Mm-hmm. And I have a question here about for you, Tamara, about sure. before we go into the Nostradamus, is because we, you know, I'm looking at the chart. Uh, the inner ring is her birth chart, and the outer is her death chart at the moment of her death. And I'm wondering, is it normal to have the house placement exactly the same as in the birth, or have we got something? wrong uh, no so what you're looking at is a du- the double ring is um everything is based on the natal chart in our life so all of the transits that happen including our death is based on our on our natal chart so that's why it looks like it lines up okay. what you're really looking for is you're looking for the planetary connections um, and uh and we can see that there were some very very significant um, well, the sun was exactly, really, one degree off her birth opposite, okay? So uh, in the dash chart, it's 25 degrees. Oh, yes, yes, yep. In yes. opposition. Yeah, in, in direct opposition. Does that happen normally? Uh, yes, we. Ha- so that happens to us every year. Every year our sun um, is in the opposite sign. So, um, uh, death? Well, no, it doesn't happen very often in the death, actually. I, I was just going to, the only thing I was going to say about that is that it's when we um, have the least amount of energy. So when the sun, when we have our solar return, which is our birthday, the sun returns to its place of birth and it kind of gives us like that little spark. It it feeds us, it gives us energy, it gives us solar energy to last us another year. When it's in the opposite position of its birth position, it it's kind of like a, it, we're waning, like we don't have very much energy. It's like the sun is the farthest away from us that it could be. So that's when she when her, she had her death chart was when she passed away, the sun was in the farthest exact spot. You were right. It's at 25 degrees Libra. Her sun is 24 degrees um, Aries. It's in exact opposition. And the life force would have been fairly weak at that moment. So that you know that can be a contributing factor absolutely also if you look at it the south the nodes are in um opposition as well so the nodes are coming into an opposition of themselves because they they normally sit across from each other well they always sit across from each other and hers of course is conjunct that uranus so it's at 14 degrees aries and um 
14 degrees Libra, her south node and her north node. And in her death chart, the nodes are coming up to that. They're 18 degrees or four, four degrees away from their actual birth spot, which is extremely unusual you see uranus is there as well so she's uh, she's just about to have a uranus return um which only happens once in our lifetime and uh for for us it can happen anywhere between the ages of let's say 79 to 84 ish um you know in that kind of uh ballpark so yeah. You know, so that happens once in our lifetime. It takes that long for Uranus to get all, you know, to get all the way back around to to itself again. So the you can see the lineup. Would you ever predict that this would be her, um, you know, a death chart? No, uh, you wouldn't predict that because you. It's normally the death will show up in somebody else's. It shows up in your kids' charts and your students' charts. It shows up in another way. Um, but in your own chart, when you see this, um, it's just like the stars aligned and, you know, this was a moment. This was a moment that she was able to pass through and uh, she decided to take it. Also, um, in the death chart, she, there's so many connections, it's, you know, it's unbelievable. But also in the death chart, there is um, the Neptune is in opposition. So the birth Neptune is that three degrees Virgo and the, um, you know, the transiting, the night sky Neptune is at five degrees Pisces. It's in opposite. It's right across, you know, from itself. Again, um, that Neptune is very integral to how she pulls in, how she connects to the collective itself. So it's in opposition. It's, you know, it was just this moment that lined up for her in the night sky and uh, she was uh, was able to tra- transition at that moment and, and decided she wanted to. Yeah, I think, and it was a choice uh, because uh, from what uh, I have been told by Julia, it was, you know, she was, she had recovered. She was doing fine. And then obviously, you know, this was in the plan and she decided to take it on some level other than conscious. Yeah, and the Uranus itself, the transiting Uranus, the night sky Uranus, um, I just said was, you know, she was about to have a Uranus return. It's at 14 degrees Aries, five minutes. So we actually have like exact, you know, exact moments in time. And when we compare that to her north node, this nodal thing that I said, she's very connected to her node. She's very connected to really that's the project itself in my opinion, that was the project, was that North Node, was this whole lifetime of doing, uh, of getting everyone to the level she got them to. And it's at 14 degrees, four minutes. It was one minute. That is like a millisecond in star time. I mean, it's not, it's like a blip, you know. I mean, it's so close. It's unbelievable, really. Um, So, you know, I mean, it's, that's why I was confirming what the birth time what or what the death time was because the chart is just so bang on to um a moment in time where you know where she chose to to leave where she chose to transition yeah absolutely it's very interesting okay yeah so um did we should we move to Nostradamus Yes, please. I'm excited to find out about this part. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So, you know, when we... Now, let's let's start with a little bit of background because maybe not everybody knows about um, Dolores and Nostradamus. Can can you guys kind of fill us in with a little bit of uh, detail? Sure. Um, I'll... Why don't we both do that, Marilyn? So I'll start by saying uh, Dolores wrote three large volumes um, about Nostradamus. And and what she basically did was she had a client who, of course, had a past life regression. And this client ended up being in their past life a student of Nostradamus. And in the explorations with this particular client as a student, so much of this student's life was 
you know, wrapped around, revolved around what um, uh, I believe the uh, the client was a female, but it was a male student, a male life that mm-hmm. that she um, was experiencing. That was um, the student of Nostradamus, and so much of the questions that, and you can just imagine this, Dolores asking these these questions. She wanted to know so much about, you know, the the teacher and the things that he was learning and everything. And I guess at some point, and it was a very pivotal moment, at some point during the regression, the uh, client sort of said, you know, as the male student, well, why don't you just ask my teacher directly? (laughs) And then Dolores started speaking with uh, Nostradamus. And they they began this amazing relationship, and and with Dolores and her curiosity and all of the questions that she would ask, uh, he was you know the perfect foil for her because he was so interested in in the occult and in the cosmos and in in the mysteries of of life and uh, itself. And but it became more and more interesting. So the books themselves, the books themselves, are in general. Uh, Dolores basically sitting there, and, and forgive me for it, if it sounds like I'm I'm making light of it because I'm I'm really not. But she basically was um, kind of a stenographer. You know, she just wrote down what uh, the um, the quatrains that Sir Thomas had penned. You know, hundreds of years ago, what they meant. She basically would go open the book and say, well, what did this one mean? And then Mr. Thomas would, would tell what, well, this is what I meant when I, you know, wrote that one. This was what this was all about. So when Dolores wrote about Mr. Thomas and when she had been and has been called an expert on him, it wasn't because of any theories that she had or any deep thinking. She literally was talking to this man across time and space. And most interesting for for me anyway, and I'm hoping we learn about this a little bit, <clears throat> was that this this conversation continued through multiple people. I think it was at Maryland, was it 12? 12 different clients? Yes, 12 different clients, which has significance. I'm going to ask Tamara about later. Yeah, 12, right? Okay, I'm buzzing. I- as I'm saying that. Right. So so she made this connection through time and space with Nostradamus as he was alive. So not as a spirit, not as a person, uh, not as a character who'd gone through a life and death, it, not as a past life sort of thing, but the living Nostradamus. The, the, he was alive at this time. So if you can imagine the scene, the scene was something like this. Nostradamus, you know, back in the 15 whatever it was, I guess, 1540s, 1580s, something like that, um, he is sitting in his studio in his office, and he is looking and uh, meditating and putting himself into a trance, looking into a piece of shiny black obsidian rock. And he, in this way, somehow by looking into this rock makes a connection with Dolores Cannon who is in Huntsville, Arkansas in her office with a client who's in trance and they start to talk to each other. So Dolores is using a living person, a client in trance laying on a bed in, you know, I, I was in the 1980s, and I'm not sure when she was doing this, so the 90s, so 1990s or maybe. She was talking to Nostradamus while he was looking at a shiny black rock, and they were speaking and having conversations across 12 different people and many, many months of talking. It's speaking through what I call real time. Right. Like a telephone. <laughs> yeah, it's like a telephone, exactly. <laughs> Very much like your dream. Yeah, and, and he had such a. I mean, she. He had such a personality, which came through mm-hmm. in you know uh, how he was, uh, you know, in comments he would make about her education, you know, because she didn't know Greek and Latin, <laughs> and you know, and and then when he found out that she was a woman, well, he was just like, how can I, how can I work with a woman because women in his day were not educated. I know. I mean, 
It's one of my favorite stories of all. You cannot deny that this was wasn't real time. You know, when the when the personality comes through like that uh, is confirmation. But they uh, worked on not all of his quatrains, but she said. I've got a, um, a video up of Dolores. It's a fairly recent one of her talking about uh, Nostradamus up on my website, and it's under uh, Dolores Cannon Speaks, if anybody's interested, because there's a lot of details there that, I, you know, it's been a while since I've read the book. Uh, book. Um, now I forgot what I was going to say. But anyway, um, it was just that, oh, about the different, uh, the, the mainly the quatrains, that they worked on were the ones that were dealing with our time. Mm-hmm. So it's like he had he consciously knew that he was going to be connecting with someone to decipher these quatrains that had befuddled people for 400 years, and finally they were going to be deciphered time when they were actually going to come to pass. Right. It's just and, so amazing. It's just, I mean, it blows my mind. <laughs> I think the part that, and I, this is just a humorous aside, but but the part that I find amazing is when Dolores tells the story, they kind of, I guess, were shutting down a session. You know, they, they'd been doing this hour after hour after hour after hour, this this uh, translation and dictation. And it was at the end of one of these sessions, they were getting ready to shut down and they were talking about, I believe it was medicine um, and doctors. And Dolores said something about a doctor that she went to and referenced the doctor being a female. And this is when Nostradamus said something like, what do you mean her? You know, it's a doctor. It must be a him. And that's when they kind of they started almost having a little argument. I just love this. If I could have been a fly on the wall. And and Dolores says, well, you know, in our time, women are doctors and they're lawyers and, and they're, they do, you know, they're physicists and they're anything that men can be. And that's when, you know, basically the, uh, Nostradamus from, from back in his day says, get out. This just this isn't possible, which yeah. I find astonishing. You know, he's talking to a rock. Uh, he's talking to a rock, a woman, you know, hundreds of years into the future. And this is this is believable to him. But the idea that it's that it's a female person he's talking to really tests his believability factor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, look at what Tam, uh, Tamar had said earlier about Dolores's uh, strong masculine the strong masculine presence in her chart, you can see she wasn't going to back down to him, you know, <laughs> right? Information and and get that through, and she wasn't going to back down. And it's probably just the type of personality that uh, is that was needed to bring through this information as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So tell um, us, tell us, um, Tamara, what it was like to start. Uh, yeah. investigating the connections between Dolores and Nostradamus. I, I was actually really shocked when I laid his chart over Dolores's. And I'm like, oh, my God, this can't be. How can this be? Because it was so powerful. Um, not only are they connected uh, in with his um, with his birth chart, but also the, his death chart is very connected to her natal chart as well. So, I was blown away because some of the connections, you know, an astrologer could say, oh, well, you know, that's generational and there's like a whole bunch of people are going to be born at that time that will have that same connection. But then when you start to dig a little bit deeper, there's a connection between their charts that is very intimate to Dolores that you would not find with, um, you know, with a generational group of people being born. So it uh, it really does show that they have this really, really deep, deep connection. The first connection I want to talk about is um, that there is this, so we we talked about um, Dolores's Saturn and her Pluto being in opposition and the Pluto being conjunct the Jupiter. So we've got this 
um, her having to learn about ego and setting aside ego and and how she worked with power and there's all these control issues you know that she had to work with and that's one of the reasons why she set this stage why she set the script that she set because it makes people feel comfortable letting go and giving somebody else control so we can see that well we lay that we lay Nostradamus over top of her chart and her, his Mars that planet of action the planet of going out and getting what you want the physical physicality of ourself is in a direct connection of minutes it's at the same degree as her Pluto it's at 18 degrees with her Pluto that combination is actually very volatile it's a it's something to control that kind of intense energy that's like a bomb going off so here you've got this really really intense connection so not only do we have that connection that we've got this Mars Pluto which lines up to that Saturn remember the Saturn is the anchor well, if you look a little further, the Saturn is conjunct his Neptune. So Dolores's Saturn of boundaries and limitations is connected to Nostradamus's Neptune, which is about dissolving boundaries. It's about being a part of the collective where there are no boundaries. So this boundary, boundaryless connection is how am I going to structure this conversation with Nostradamus and be able to punch a hole through time, Saturn is time, in order to connect with Nostradamus. This is how, this is the line, this is the, the power punch, this is the, the hole that was punched through time for her to be able to talk to him live. That's how I believe that line is activated in the chart. That's not the only thing that we've got that we're looking at, but it's just such a powerful, powerful signature between the two of them directly. And remember, they're born hundreds of years apart. So for this connection, you know, to come up so powerful like this is just bizarre. Then we can move to, okay, we've got this really collective connection, um, now we can look at their Jupiters. Remember me saying that Jupiter is the planet of wisdom and growth and opportunity? Well, guess whose Jupiters are conjunct? <laughs> he has the same exalted Jupiter as she has. Hmm. They're conjunct. They're sitting side by side. So it's this deeper level of they share some level of wisdom. They share this opportunity in order for his wisdom to come through to our time period and be interpreted by Dolores. She may have only she may have called herself a scribe, but she still had to um decipher his language because even though um you know because he's speaking, you know, a different dialect of English. You know, so she's still going to have to interpret it to some point. Well, that's the Jupiter that's allowing her to connect to that innate wisdom that the two of them share in order to deliver the message. Actually, he was really missed because he wanted someone to sp that would speak French. Right. <laughs> French or Latin. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 I was just going to say his native language was, was, was French. And oh, my goodness. Oh, my yeah. goodness. Yes. Yeah. Well, and fun, funnily enough, um, there's actually two signatures in their charts together. Uh, there, so Dolores' Mars is in opposition to his Venus. So that's a little bit of a disconnect where, um, you know, where you could see him saying, oh, a woman, you know, oh my God, like, how? why do I have to speak with a woman? And also a woman in power, his um, Pluto is squared Dolores's moon. So there was a really powerful, um, uh, again, remember, square is not a nice, pretty word. It's like difficult. So it's a difficulty. They had to overcome the feminine energy to the power, you know, to the masculine power. So they had to overcome that and they did overcome it. They did, because remember, when we come up against a square, when we utilize that energy in a skilled way, great things come from it. And that's exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. Well, in support to that, to that 
energy, that square was going on, that lunar energy, the the moon, this powerful moon that Dolores had in, in Aries, we've already talked about, his north node is in a direct connection, a direct um, conjunction to this moon. That's where the personal thing comes in. You're not going to find that anywhere but with Dolores and Nostradamus. That's the mind blower. So then his north node, the direction he needed to go in, was to connect to Dolores's subconscious, which you know Dolores brought to her consciousness. She Her subconscious was not buried where she wouldn't be able to take this connection and move it to the next level. Uh-uh. Dolores has this connection between her subconscious and her conscious. And that's where they took this information and brought it to us. That's just so fascinating. Tamara, it, how did this, you know, I'm, I'm a baby when it comes to astrology. So I really, you know, there's so much that I don't understand. And I'm, I'm quite frankly, some of it's still kind of going over my head, although you're doing a fabulous explanation, uh, um, job explaining it. Um, oh, good. Some of it, it, you really are. Some of it is still, I'm, I'm learning I, I need to have um, a couple lessons in this. But, <laughs> but what is it, how is it that they, uh, they magnetized it magnetized or created the connection. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes, yes. So that to me is the Mars, Pluto, Saturn, Neptune. It's all in a line. It lines up in the chart. So it's literally a linear line in the chart. They're they're in they are in line. His Mars to her Pluto to her Saturn to his Neptune. They're in a straight line, a linear line. That to me is the whole punch through time. So that literally when you say, you know, they, they're meeting, their connection, they're working yep. together was written in the stars. It was written yes. in the stars yes. in, in that exact way. Yes. And, and, and how about this then, like the, the timing that when they first discovered each other and yeah. I mean, how does that all play in? Well, I would love to have that exact time and maybe that's something we could pursue, you know, and, and write about later um, is that I, I want that exact time because somehow I'm going to look at because I can look at his chart and I can look at her chart and somehow try and bring that moment, what, that moment that happened, yeah. the window of opportunity that came for two of them to uh, to connect. But it really is, it's the nodes, the moon, that's, that is such a personal connection. Um, it's a connection through the soul, through, um, you know, the past and the future, because the nodes are where the past and the future come together. That's, you can't have one without the other. That's the thing about the nodes. They're always in opposition to each other. The past is always in opposition to the future. So this is where it all came together, through Dolores' moon. Hmm. Now, his moon, which is at 15 Scorpio, is in opposition to her Chiron. So his um, his uh, soul, his patterns and habits that he developed to function, because the moon is how we function in our day-to-day life. It's our subconscious. Um, it was in a an opposition to her Chiron and Chiron is the wounded healer. It's about the, the wound we need to heal uh, over lifetimes. It's the wound we carry lifetime after lifetime after lifetime until we get to the point where we're skilled enough to be able to heal it. So again, an opposition means that it's not an easy thing. It wasn't an easy thing for him to do this, but it was through his ability to connect to this, this rock to this uh, to the level of depth because that rock took him into his subconscious, took him down into his subconscious in order to heal. What did he want to heal? He wanted people to actually get his message because the message had been lost. Yeah. Dolores's Chiron is conjunct. It, it's conjunct her um, her Mercury, her you know her ability to communicate. So her Chiron and Mercury are um, dead center 
to this moon. It slices right up in between the two of them. So we we know that the communication, the writing, the healing, this wasn't just for Dolores. Yeah. This was for Nostradamus. He needed this healing to happen. He was he was probably wrought with sadness that the world really did not get his message. And here he had opportunity to deliver the message again in modern times when the, when the information was supposed to be actually coming, you know, to fruition. So this was a healing for both of them. This connection was so, um, Oh, I mean, it's just so, so powerful. It's unbelievable as, as is the death chart. Nostradamus's death with Dolores Cannon's chart. Again, another very, very powerful, powerful thing. Now, I've, I've talked about symbology, and there's one more thing I want to I want to talk about here before we um, go any further with this. So there was a group of um, or a, a book written uh, with all of these symbols, and each symbol represents a degree in the um, astrology chart. So every single degree has a symbol associated with it. They were done by Elsie Wheeler and Mark Edmund Jones. Mark Edmund Jones was a a really, really famous, famous astrologer in um, the 19, in 1925, in the the early uh, 1900s. Um, He was a really, really famous, uh, very technical, well-known incredible astrologer. He really made astrology come back to life in uh, North America. So he um, met this Elsie Wheeler, who was a extraordinary clairvoyant. And actually, Elsie was um, in a wheelchair. So she came from a wealthy family, and her family sent her out to study spirituality because she was an incredible psychic to develop her psychic skills. And she got involved in this group that Okay, so um, can everyone hear me now? I'm going to go to the chat room and see if you all can hear me. Something about um, something about Skype just dropped us off. Um, can you all hear me? Yay, Alba says hi. Okay, so we're going to reconnect via telephone. And I see that we have Tamara right here. Hello. Hi, Tamara. Hi. <laughs> I'm so oh glad you're there. That was that was uh, that was um, weird. Hey, you just uh, dropped us off there, and wow. Yeah, I, I just I'm not sure why we have to jump through these technological hoops, but um, thank you all for remaining with us through these. Yeah difficulties and hopefully we can get uh Marilyn. Marilyn, I hope that, that you can give us a call and join us. Um yeah. join us again. But let's see. Um quite frankly I'm I'm so distracted by getting us back online. I'm not exactly sure where we were. I I can tell you that there was only about twenty or thirty seconds uh before I let you know that we were offline. Okay. So if okay. you could just back up that far we were talking sure. about Nostradamus. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay, so what I was talking about was that I was looking at the degrees of significance in the chart. And um and I used these uh symbols called Sabian symbols and I was um kind of talking about the origin of them. They were channeled by a woman in 1925 called Elsie Wheeler. And um, Mark Edmund Jones was a really famous astrologer at the time and uh, wrote lots and lots of books on astrology. And he worked with her on these symbolic messages that kind of followed every degree around. Why that's so significant, why I needed to tell you that, is that the 18-degree Pluto, uh, it's 18 uh, and some, so we always take it up to 19. So we've got... 19, we'll just go round numbers, 19 degrees Pluto for Dolores, 19 degrees um, Mars for Nostradamus. And where it really jumped out at me and was kind of shocking was when I looked at his death chart. Um, His death chart, his son 
was at 19 degrees Cancer. His sun was conjunct his Mars, which of course is conjunct her Pluto, and it lines up that hole that they've got punched in between you know, between the worlds, like this line of communication, this direct communication. It's not past life. It's They're talking direct. So his son is conjunct this. So I'm like, well, what in the world does that symbol mean? Like, let's get some depth in this. Like, where where's the Sambian symbols take us with this? Well, when I looked it up, I kind of fell off my chair. It's making levels of commitment to a person or a project. It's vows of allegiance. It's new ventures and its union that's the that's the meaning of that symbol of 19 degrees cancer i was blown away because really it gives us that level of understanding what were these guys doing together they had made a commitment to come together for this project and it was a sacred vow that they took expressions of loyalty it was sanctified unity so it just blew me away oh and my that, gosh i know it just was so so I so am deep buzzing all over with that yes. so what you're saying is there was like a there was like some sort of soul contract here that yes that... absolutely no question in my mind they had made a contract to each other they made a commitment to each other that for this project that not only would they would they bring the information to us but from Nostradamus but also that Dolores was here fulfilling her contract in taking us to the next level in connecting us to our conscious mind in developing this technique that allowed us to move through time and realizing that we do have the ability to punch a time, punch a hole through time, to talk to a live person, not just to a past life. That's what really blew me away is that it is possible, and that's what they brought us. That's just absolutely, absolutely amazing. So actually, um, we're seeing um, MJ... Allinger, our amazing researcher of the Dolores Cannon work, she's doing indexing for our incredible original support forum group. She has, um, she's putting something here in the chat room. Uh, it's called The End and the Beginning, and Dolores' comment in this chapter, Dolores describes how she was chosen to work with Mr. Domus and what his purpose for translating his quatrains were and a look into the human caring Heart. And he mm-hmm. said, and uh, Dolores says, I've been wondering why he chose me to be the one to do this. Did I have any sort? Uh, did I have any kind of an association with him in a past life? Mm-hmm. Nostradamus responds, not because of any karmic association. Dolores was most strategically located mm-hmm. somehow on reference to, uh, and then I'm not exactly sure. Um, that's just so astonishing, so astonishing. Um, yeah. The stars literally lined up for them to be able to do what they did. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's pretty phenomenal. Pretty phenomenal. Wow. So I had to I had to make sure I was able to bring that to you guys so you guys could um could ponder that. <laughs> that's you just- know astonishing yeah and i know and and you made you made some sort of um some sort of comment that it was almost as if they were the same person yeah well that's the way it to me that it came across in the chart was that um you know that that she was him that somehow they were connected on it wasn't just two people connecting through time that on some level she was talking to herself that this connection was so so much deeper because it wasn't a, it wasn't her in a past life it was her talking to her actual self it's like punching a hole in time so the the chart is so powerful in the signature that's exactly where my mind went is somehow you know she she is him or they are one 
and you know this this thought of sanctified unity there's some level of unity that's you know that's ta- that that has taken place here between the two of them that's just that's just astonishing um you know i had this um i i had a, in march when i was in arkansas i was very close to um where Dolores worked, where where I was staying that night. And I had several dreams, five, as a matter of fact, five dreams in a row about Dolores. This was March of this year. And uh, each one was incredibly powerful. But one dream was about uh, no... Um, and, and she literally took him by the hand... And they they stood shoulder to shoulder, and they came up to me, and he and she said to me, "I want you to meet Mr. Damas." And then she she told me that, um, gosh, I don't have my notes in front of me. I wish I did, uh, but it was something like uh, the connection that they had was the most important part of the story, and that there was far more to this story that. Um, that we needed to know about and that we could learn about. And I think your research here is part of that. It's the beginning steps of that. And I think, I mean, tell me if, if you, if you agree, it seems to me that Dolores and Nostradamus from the, from the other side of the veil are now possibly trying to tell us that we can do this too. Yeah. Uh, We can do what they did. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree that that again the stars have aligned and we are being told that uh that this is something that that we can take it to the next level. This is something we can do too. It's it's punching a hole in in time in order to speak directly. Absolutely. How phenomenal will that be? It is it's just um it's so exciting and and do you think camera i mean you know this is just conjecture and everything but i mean is there something about the time that dolores chose as and and again this is this is me knowing nothing about astrology (laughs) is there something about the chosen time of her death that increases this um, message or this connection or this opening or do you, do you know what I'm saying? Is there something about that that helps more of the communication, or am I just sort of reading into it? No, I mean I think that the the death chart is a very significant um, chart, and absolutely, just like this deal with um, like the the death chart between Nostradamus Nostradamus's death chart and Dolores's natal chart is also surprisingly, you know, well connected. So yes, the ta- the moment because of how powerful that moment was for Dolores, like we saw connection after connection in her chart, which doesn't always happen in a death chart. You don't always see the death chart really connected so significantly to the the birth chart um, in a person. You know, you, normally it's our family and friends that we see. Um, you know, the connections with. But for her, her death charts just sings out that this was a a moment chosen in time. So definitely taking a look at her death chart and um, really studying that death chart is going to give us some clues, I think, just like this Nostradamus thing. And maybe that's the next step is that we need to take a look at, um, at what information we can glean from that and you know work with that like you have a beautiful connection with Dolores with um your moon and her Jupiter so remember me talking about that Jupiter the planet of wisdom it's one of the one of the most beautiful contacts in a chart is is a moon Jupiter connection it's like having a best friend um forever mm-hmm. you know yeah you know when you meet when you meet somebody and you're like oh that person's going to be my best friend you just know on some level that they're so connected to you so 
um, you guys have a beautiful connection together. So, you know, the, the, we're all connected. There's there's all these ways that you can look at, um, you know, how we're connected and the strengths that we have uh, with each other, even when they pass. Uh, sometimes those connections get even stronger. So, well. Um I, you know, I'll only take a moment to say, first I want to say I believe we've got Marilyn again um, through a very creative Hi. connection. <laughs> Hi, <No>. Marilyn. <laughs> Hello, Marilyn. Can but, you hear me? Um, okay. Yes, we we absolutely can. I, Tamara, you've given me the greatest, the greatest gift in just the last few seconds. You know, I was so blessed to be able to spend – uh, quite a bit of significant time with Dolores in real life in Arkansas. But mm. since her passing, I've had a more uh, continuous connection with her and, and conversation and communication with her. And it's been growing steadily, uh, both in sort of a meditative state and, and in also a dream state. Uh, I'm getting lots of connections, lots of information. And what you just said about Moon and Jupiter, uh, I, I just I can't even tell you. And, and, and I know that I asked you some questions about, um, you know, there's been some what I believe in my heart and in my soul. I believe that there's been other communication that she has sent through to me, but not just to me, to many other people, to other practitioners and even to clients and fans. She has mm-hmm. been able to communicate with other people through the presence of birds. And mm. uh, in particular, uh, red cardinals and, and lately eagles. And um, I just, I, I think it's, it's another form of communication. And I have no idea if astrology, you know, talks about anything uh, such as that, but I, I truly believe that uh, what she, she always called herself a reporter, and and she was very uh, down home and earthy about that when she would say, "I'm just a reporter. I'm a reporter of lost history." But I've come to think of her as the consummate communicator, and some of the things that you've said tonight just illustrate that and 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 explain that so beautifully. And and I wonder about these other. These other ways of communicating too, through you know, through the dream time, through animals, and through other things. Yes, absolutely. It's all connected. It's all the language, the symbolic language, and interpretation of it is. It's an art, and uh, as you know, you know. I mean, that's what uh, what we're doing with QHHT as well is um, you know looking at that symbolic language, but that language goes through many many forms, not just you know the the form of of the heart astrology itself but like you said the dream especially um dream uh s- symbology is a very very important um aspect of how we can gather more and more information and have access to more and more information Tamara, I'm I'm just going to finish um MJ's yeah. uh thought in the chat room and then we'll let Marilyn weigh in since she's taken a little break. Where'd you go, Marilyn? Anyway. I'm just, I'm just here. <laughs> um so M- MJ was saying that um uh what she was saying in, in, in that was written was that Dolores was most strategically located in reference to Various pathways of time and various dimensions of time and how they interact. Plus, they were involved through her work in contact with souls with a type of mentality to handle the information and communicate. So, um, and she says there's so many beautiful correlations between, Tam, your your information, your beautiful detailed information about Dolores' chart and and what uh, Dolores wrote in her book. So I know that there's many of us out there who who are really appreciating this discovery, and it seems like maybe we've just scratched the surface. Marilyn, what do you have to say? Yeah. Well, I could go on because I'm, you know, I'm really interested in the uh, numerology of it. Not that I'm a numerologist, but the 18 showing up so many times, which breaks down to number nine. Nine is the number of completion. Uh, but also I wonder if that is the key that's put in the lock 
through time that has made this connection? I don't know. What do you think, Pam? Well, actually, I'm just looking at Dolores' death chart itself, like by, you know, by itself so I can see it as the wheel. And um, Jupiter is at 18 degrees, which is that, you know, that same number, and the nodes are at 18 degrees. So it is very interesting that, um, you know, that that number uh, does show up so often uh, in yeah. different, you know, even in different forms, like 18 degrees Aries, 18 degrees uh, Libra. So it's got all these scripts that it's carrying, but yet it's delivering the same message, absolutely, you know, mm-hmm. completion. Yeah, and it seems to show up in, uh, you know, not just, in very important places, I guess. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it to show up over and over again. So, and and like I say, not that I'm a numerologist, but I'm wondering if in the audience and the, amongst the practitioners, I'm sure there are people who are uh, into, in fact, I know there are, who study numerology that may be able to shed some light on this. You know, it'd be mm-hmm. fabulous to hear from them. Yeah. Um, and actually, uh, the um, so in her in her uh, death chart, um, she has in the twelfth house, which is another house that's very connected to QHHT. So if you guys are um, you know budding astrologers out there and you're looking at your chart, not only would you look at the eighth house. We talked about the mysteries in the 8th house. The 12th house is actually like a direct connection to that which is greater than ourselves. Some might call it God or higher self or, you know, I mean, there's uh, many, many, many names we can call that. But it is that level of connection to the collective in the 12th house. Her son, um, her in her death chart, her death son, Venus, Mercury, and the North Node all sit in that 12th house of, you know, connection to the collective, to that which is greater. Uh, very, very significant in the death chart. Um, I was uh, pretty amazed to see that as well. But, you know, I, I mean, it, I'm amazed, but then I'm not. I mean, I, I, you know, you <laughs> expect it, right? So you're like, yeah, I mean, that makes complete and absolute sense. So hmm. it's all there in black and, yeah. black and white and, and red and green and blue because I have mine in all colors. Yeah. And we wonder, you know, if she isn't sitting back there because I know, you know, she's listening. It was Barbara yes. Becker uh, said she's you know, having communication and said she's listening to all this. And I wonder if she's just sitting back and having a chuckle, wondering <laughs> how long it was going to take us to see all this. And this kind of connects with your eagle too, Candace, because I'm thinking, you know, the eagle uh, sees the bigger picture, okay? We're looking oh, yeah. at a, a birth chart and death chart, uh, snapshots of the sky. How yes. much bigger a picture can you get than that? Yes. Right, and the birds in the sky. And, you know, it, I've got this story too. Um, this This will end up being in my book, but... Years and years before I ever even met Dolores, I have this amazing story about, and it's a very long and beautiful story, but I I ended up somehow miraculously raising two beautiful, uh, from from just being hatched, mind you, um, cardinals, and they ended up being male cardinals. And I never, ever, ever, as much as I love cardinals, and I always thought it was nice and keen and sweet that, you know, Dolores's you know, bird was a cardinal, I, I never connected them until I had another kind of communication from her um, not too long ago where she was telling me that it was like a precursor. And when, Tamara, when you were talking about the moon and the Jupiter and the best friends thing, I mean, those two birds were like flying around my head. And and yeah. and me raising these birds. I mean, that was five years before I ever even heard of Dolores Cannon. That was back, Marilyn, when you were first just reading her convoluted Universe Two book, which, by the way, I believe was the book that was sent to me in the mail by a, uh, just an online friend, which is how I also was introduced <laughs> to Dolores Cannon. Uh, you know, funny? convoluted I... Universe Two. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I want to tell you. For you then. Oh, sorry, Candace. Uh, are you there, Candace? I am. Okay, I have a question for you. When 
uh, did you learn or did you read Convoluted One? Uh, I read it after Convoluted Two because it did was you? two okay. that yeah it was two that showed up in my mailbox from the friend um, that okay. that that led me to even be introduced to Dolores. Well, I always thought it was it was strange that I read Convoluted Two first, and then I read all her other books, but I didn't read Convoluted One until just this past summer, and <laughs> I was blown away with the information in the in Convoluted One because I'm thinking, well, you know, after five, how much more are we going to get? And I I I was just blown away by that book. So I love that. <laughs> I love that. And Tamara, I'm sorry, we were talking over you. What did you want to say? That's okay. I, I wanted to tell you how significant the cardinal is. Um, Dolores's canon, we look for foundational energy, and we do it by looking at the elements in her chart, and we um, we go through it and we come up with a final element that the person is uh, most um, connected to. And Dolores is, is cardinal fire. So it's kind of funny that the cardinal <laughs> oh and God. fire is red. So it's card it's okay. the cardinal, yeah. So yeah. anyways, that, I thought I would share that with you, that that is her bird, absolutely. She is cardinal fire. That's brilliant, Tamara, I, because I've thought about that. I, you know, I haven't ever thought about that. And we're constantly making cardinal references, and we have cardinals in our rooms where we work, and, you know, it's always about the cardinal, and I never put two and two together there. Yeah, it's her foundational energy. It's uh, And not because her, it's not because her sun is there. It's actually we go through a whole process of looking at all the planets, and there's a calculation that we make, and her foundational energy, Dolores' foundational energy is, cardinal fire so it is yeah, the cardinal yeah. bird for sure it's very Absolutely. nice yeah. yeah how incredibly wonderful is that that that's just icing on the cake on top of everything else that we've learned tonight that is so brilliant and so beautiful well there you have it guys that's uh just to taste you know to wet your taste buds and get you interested <laughs> in uh and in digging a little deeper into uh into the astrology, the mystery of astrology, and how it might be able to help and get us a little deeper. Yeah. Well, you've got you've got me as a as a client coming up. I I want to know more about my chart now for sure. Absolutely. <laughs> I definitely I definitely know. Well, ladies, this has been such a joy and such a pleasure. I want to thank you so very much for uh, joining me this Friday evening and telling everyone, um, uh, you know, your um, discoveries and your thoughts. And uh, why, don't we, why don't we tell our listeners how they can find both of you in the future? Marilyn, how can people find you uh, if they're looking for QHHT sessions in the Vancouver area? Okay, I'm at Body Soul Apothecary. Dot com. Uh, I believe it's up on the screen, uh, um, and you can find me there. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so very much. And Tamara, Thank where you. exactly are you located? Yeah, actually, I am now in the east coast of Canada, so I'm actually in Nova Scotia, and uh, I'm uh, in Halifax, Dartmouth, which is a particular area of Nova Scotia. So um, you can get a hold of me either through my website, which is silverdisc.ca, or you could email me at tamara at silverdisc.ca and uh, and connect there. Well, thank you, thank you so much again, ladies. Um, You're very welcome. It was I, wonderful. It was such a fun night. It was. Yeah, it it was. was so much fun. It was so much fun. I I, I thank you so much. So, again, I'd like to remind those of you out there who are looking for a practitioner of Dolores' method, if you're not on either coast of Canada and you might want to find maybe someone else around the world, you can find them at DoloresCannonQHHT.com. That's DoloresCannonQHHT.com. 
newearthpractice.com, and you can find out more about me and my own practice of QHHT at newearthjourney.com. And I also have a little BBS radio show on every other Tuesday, and it's called New Earth Journey. And as we say good evening, I'm going to try to play um, our wonderful friend. There we go. Latita Teresa's flute music again as we close the show. And Latita is a composer and a musician, a performing artist, an author, and a storyteller. She began her career as a flautist for the District of Columbia Youth Symphony Orchestra. Her dexterity and musical ability is known no bounds. She's a, she excels in the varying fields of pop, classical, jazz, new age, and musical theater. Accordingly, she unites her original passion for classical, renaissance, and baroque music and the velvet rhythms of jazz. And you can find her at latita.com. Thank you so much, Latita, for allowing us to use your beautiful flute music for our show. And thank you so much for joining us, all of you, in the chat room, all our Facebook friends and N5D friends. And join us again next Friday evening where we're going to have an excellent show. We're going to talk baseball. Yes, we are. We're going to talk talk baseball with Lou Gehrig, uh, who um, there's an interesting story there, and look forward to next week's show with Quantum Healing with Candace. So thank you all, and good night. Uh, Venus could bring us to her Mercury. Um, the one thing that I always noticed about um, Dolores was, you know, when she was doing the regression work, that beautiful, soft, melodic voice that she used. Well, her Mercury, how Mercury is how we communicate, not what we communicate, but how the the tool that we have to communicate, uh, which, you know, in one one of those tools is our voice, another one would be writing, that kind of thing, um, was in Taurus. And Taurus is ruled by this beautiful, exalted Venus that she has. So that, to me, that's that I kind of made that connection to her voice with, um, with this beautiful Venus. Yeah, that's so true. Wow, that's a good one, uh, Tam. I didn't even notice that <laughs> on that one. <laughs> Okay. I'm here, Tam. Did we lose Tam? Oh no, sorry, okay. I was I was muted. Oh that's so <laughs> So the the um chart helps us unfold information about ourselves to allow us to kind of dig a little deeper like how why do we tick this way how do we tick this way it's not it's we can't use it as an excuse because you know skilled unskilled behavior there is no excuse for unskilled behavior i mean it, it happens we all have unskilled behavior from time to time but once you recognize like what the skill could be then you can tap into that a little more frequently so um, this exalted, these exalted planets that she had, she she had a couple other planets that were also exalted. Uh, would they they helped her be um, skilled because the exalted planets are a little easier to work with, like her Venus. You know how you Venus is um, one of those planets that uh, is a part of our physical body in the sense of magnetizing ourselves. So you know when you meet those people and they have that magnetic quality and you're like oh you know you really like you want to be around them or you're attracted to them and you you know they're special in some way because I mean we're all special but um, it's just in how we magnetize our uh, physical the physical uh, feature of our self um, so it's the Mars is how we go out and get things that we need. It's that part of the, it's the push-pull of the magnetization. She had a very powerful Mars. Her Mars was in Leo, 
which is ruled by the sun, very, very powerful, and this beautiful, soft Venus that was in Pisces, and this push-pull of these two energetic sides of her nature on how she went out and got what she wanted, and how she would draw towards herself what she needed. So, very beautiful. So, I guess we'll just continue along with her um, with her chart here on some of the things that I um, boast about her. Um, she ha- so I'm, I've talked about her having this exalted planet. Her sun in Aries was also exalted. So it also has had this sort of special quality that she would be able to tap into. Obviously, you know, we're not born skilled. These are skills that we have to grow with and, and learn how to utilize. But her um, son, the spirit, was very, very powerful in her chart as well, as well as her exalted Jupiter. Jupiter is a really beautiful planet when it's functioning well, you know, when it's skilled. Um, her Jupiter was in Cancer. And Jupiter is about opportunities and growth and wisdom. Um, Hers was very powerful. It sat with a very powerful player that we're going to talk uh, about a lot with um, Dolores because I think it was a very integral part of her personality. And her Jupiter sat with her Pluto. And I think we've all probably heard the word Pluto. And I think if you haven't, uh, well, if you have heard the word Pluto, then you kind of shake a little bit. You're like, oh, do we need to go there? Do we need to talk about Pluto? Pluto has this uh, beautiful side to it as well as uh, as this really difficult side. But her exalted Jupiter sat with this Pluto and, and you know, would help and support this Pluto considerably. Um, her Mars was in Leo. That was another beautiful part of her chart. And... Um, her, we look at what's called a dispositor tree. It it takes all of the parts of the psyche and it looks at how they support each other and whether they support each other. Sometimes the psyche is well supported. Sometimes it struggles a little bit with, um, you know, with these weird loops that it's got to go through and it has to kind of ask every aspect of the person's psyche before it moves forward and does things. And sometimes it has these dictators running it that are just running the show and and creating havoc. In her particular case, she had this beautiful mutual reception. And a mutual reception is when two planets are in each other's sign and they support each other. And her whole chart was supported by her Mars, her ability to go out and get what she needed and, and do what she needed to do, action things she needed to action, and this sun. And remember that the sun... Is, uh, now we'll get a little bit into the to the QHHT stuff as to how her chart fits so well in the work that she did. Uh, the sun is um, it's it's our solar energy. It's um, connected to the greater self, to the greater being, to the observer self. So this part of herself of Dolores, why she was so um good at what she did and and did so well you know with what she did in the business and and uh the teaching that she did was because i believe of this this mars um sun connection of this mutual reception that they had the support they had for each other so when she uh would become and the sun is also our consciousness by the way it's our the moon is our subconscious and the sun is our conscious behavior. So this is part of what she did, bringing the conscious awareness into um, the, this moment in time, into a functioning part of the of the person that she was working with to be doing the healing. So I thought this was a really significant um, foundational energy that she carried in her chart that really explained the work that she did. And I think that was another reason, Marilyn, why her moon was also in Aries, because it, um, you know, the subconscious, it's bringing the con- the subconscious into the conscious, you know, like having that moment of uh, becoming conscious of what the subconscious is doing and and whether it is supporting us or whether it's holding us back from things that we're trying to accomplish in this life. Okay, well, I I agree with you, and I look at that, and I think you know, subconscious, conscious mind, or conscious mind, and yeah, and the subconscious are in balance. When they I look are, at, yeah. yeah, yeah, 
And then she has this really, I talked a little bit about the stellium, about this um, Uranus. Uh, well, the stellium, the, it's, the, it's the sun, Uranus, and the moon that are all in Aries. And it's called a stellium. It's like a little pack of energy that um, is all like focused on one thing. And of course, it's the eighth house. It's the mysteries that she was focused on. But the Uranus, the planet itself, is about our higher uh, mental capacity. It's our observer self. It's um, our genius. The Mercury is our lower mind, and the Uranus is our higher mind. And I thought, wow, how apropos is her son conjunct this Uranus uh, in the eighth house? Because that's exactly where she took this. It's bringing the the observer self, bringing the the uh, the genius aspect of ourself into our conscious mind to be able to have a conversation. Mm. Well, not only that, I mean, the woman had a mind like a steel trap. <laughs> yes. You know, I would love to be able to bring up details of, of yeah. sessions that she could, you know, she just rattle on. I think she could go on for hours. True, Candace? She she really could. I have this. I have this particular memory where somebody was asking her, and I don't even remember what the question was because if the question didn't matter. It was the way she answered the question that mattered. Somebody asked a very detailed question about something, and Dolores stopped for a moment, and she literally said something along. The Blog Talk Radio. Greetings, and welcome to Quantum Healing with Candace. I am your host, Candace Craw goldman This program was created to assist humans in this rapidly changing world, and its foundation is based upon the late, great Dolores Cannon's work. So thank you, Dolores, for continuing to be here with us. And also thanks to Greg Prescott and Michelle Walling at In5D.com for making this show possible. And this beautiful flute music playing in the background, which I'm hoping to get maybe a little better (laughs) better heard by you all, is courtesy of our dear friend and supporter of the show, Latita Teresa. And the title is Africanique. With humanity's new understanding and acceptance of the quantum world and the role that consciousness plays in shaping both our individual and collective reality, we have plenty of subject material. I am a full-time practitioner of Dolores' hypnosis method and had the honor and privilege of working with and alongside of her for several years. You can find out more about my practice at newearthjourney.com. And before we get started tonight, for those of you looking for a practitioner of Dolores' method, you may find these wonderful people at DoloresCannonQHHT.com. That's DoloresCannonQHHT.com. Also, if you would like to participate live on tonight's show, please call in the U.S. 646. 716-8890. That's 646-716-8890. And we'll try to answer as many calls as possible. Tonight is December 4th, 2015. And I am very excited about this evening's show. About as excited as any show that I've ever done, actually. I'm I'm welcoming not only one, but two very special women to talk about Dolores Cannon tonight. Marilyn Dyke is 
a wonderful friend and a QHHT colleague who lives in Vancouver, Canada. I've had the great fortune to have worked with her in person, and I'm honored to call Marilyn my personal friend. I've known her for many years. She was and is a fine voice, not only of wisdom, but of integrity in our shared group, which is Dolores Cannon's original worldwide support forum for practitioners of her method of quantum healing. Marilyn's lifelong curiosity compelled her to explore many different subjects. She found that information that couldn't be explained in the usual manner was much more interesting than other material. Unusual ideas and theories piqued her interest. And through this search for knowledge, she explored the unexplained. And along the way, she took an interest and practiced different healing modalities, including herbal medicine, flower essences, souls, and Reiki. And when she discovered Dolores Cannon's book, Convoluted Universe Book 2, in 2004, she knew she had finally found an author who was receiving answers to many of her questions. It was her interest in healing that convinced her to take Dolores Cannon's Past Life Regression Level 1 class in 2009, and she continued her studies with Dolores and became a Level 3 practitioner in 2013. Hi, Marilyn. Stand by while I introduce Tamara. Tamara McGillivray, McGillivray, I think is better pronounced is a professional astrologer and symbolist. And I don't even know what a symbolist is. Tamara, you're going to have to let me know, who uses a variety of energy techniques to help her clients uncover their potential and interact with the universe in a way that manifests their highest good in this life and place. She holds a BA in East-West traditions and ancient religions and astrology. She's a yoga teacher, a meditation coach, a Reiki master, she studied with Dolores Cannon as a QHHT practitioner, and she is certified level two. She is a professional astrologer. She's also a teacher and board member of Kepler College and the past president of the local San Diego chapter of the National Council of Geocosmic Research. That's pretty interesting, too. I don't even know what that is. She'll have to let us know. She writes a monthly astro column for an online Canadian magazine, and she's the owner of Silver Disc Consulting, which is dedicated to connecting ancient wisdom to the modern world through speaking engagements, workshops, one-on-one consultations, and also a weekly blog. As a lifelong learner and teacher, she opens up new perspectives for herself and others through her work with a variety of energy techniques. Marilyn and Tamara and I will be taking an in-depth look at QHHT founder, author, and teacher Dolores Cannon's astrology chart. Tamara has discovered some very rare and unique connections between Dolores' chart and another very well-known figure that may help us to understand the very big and real topics of time and timelessness. So without further ado, I want to welcome both Marilyn and Tamara to the show. Welcome, ladies, to the show. Thank you. (laughs) Yes, thank you. (laughs) I'm so excited to have you here. I'm also so excited that our Skype connection is working. Yay, all of you people out there who put the white pyramid of light around the technology to make this happen. Marilyn, I'd like to start out by asking you, how did you and Tamara meet, and how long have you been friends? Well, I think we've been friends about 20 years, and uh, really, Tamara and I met when I was first really seriously uh, looking into spirituality, metaphysics, and I remember I was in a bookstore, and she was uh, one of the people there who was doing classes and but also helping out I think it was a Saturday and and so she literally followed me around and was talking about I don't know wolves the different colors of wolves I don't know but anyway she literally followed me around and then um, finally uh, you know I uh, we talked some more and I found out she was teaching some classes 
I was interested in. And then yeah, we, I took some classes. We um, worked together a lot with Reiki and have just been, you know, she is my my rock, my go-to person for information and is also a great motivator for me. <laughs> and I, I couldn't, I wouldn't want to be in this life, as I said before, without Tamara. I think that was probably one of the uh the points that in your know, sticking points I made, I had to be here with Tamara. She's a, oh, a lovely tweet, <laughs> and, and yeah, just just I'm so pleased to have her as a friend. As am I, Marilyn. That's a very <laughs> sweet uh, introduction of our friendship. Yes, we've been friends forever, and uh, have done many many things together, including our QHHT training. We did that together even. Marilyn Marilyn insisted <laughs> that we did it together. <laughs> now, now, where did you all take that class? I was in Fayetteville. Yes, it was. So you and, both traveled in the lines of. Um, the answer to that question is in Convoluted Universe, page one, you know, two, page 193 or something like that. I mean, she actually pulled out a page number of where somebody should go. And maybe it was because she'd referenced it before or something, but it was just astonishing to me. She could just do that. And she did it all the time. I mean, she just she just rattled that off all the time. And And what was so interesting to me, too, was that she would do this, this sort of uh, uh, presentation of an, an encyclopedic mind. She would do that on stage. And yet when you were with her in a casual situation, um, you know, walking to and from class or having a bite to eat or whatever, she wasn't like that. Um, she kind of, uh, she talked about the weather. You know, she talked about food. It was just very, she was a very interesting woman in that way. Actually, that was a um, something that uh, you had uh, mentioned to me before, too. So I wanted to see where that was in the chart. And I really believe that that was the higher mind and the lower mind. Working. When she was on stage, that was the higher mind, the Uranus, that would, would uh, streamline, just stream information to her. And when you were with her in person and you were having lunch or going for a coffee, that was the lower mind. That's the Mercury. The Mercury was in Taurus. Taurus loves food. It loves, um, you know, to just talk about everyday things. It's a very down-to-earth, um, you know, aspect to uh, to having a Mercury. And also it kind of slows everything down. So the fast pace of the Aries gets down into this really more methodical thinking. Well, that brings to mind when, uh, when we were doing the level three, uh, Candace, you remember, I mean, this just shocked me because I'd never been in a small group with Dolores before, but I mean, not only was she, you know, like as you know, the higher mind and the lower mind, you could, she could flip back and forth and she was, it was like she was, constantly running both i would i would think because mm-hmm. and you know she not only was she trying to teach us and critique our our videos and whatnot but she was also worried about well it, are you too warm are you too cold uh what are the snacks like have you got enough you know are you know are you sure you're okay <laughs> you know she was so concerned about us yeah uh, that's and, the venus talking yeah oh the venus okay yeah so she could just uh yeah just out of the blue, she'd be her mind would be off into um, just very everyday mundane uh, matters concerning whether we were all oh, feeling okay or or whatever. It was quite interesting to see her like that. Mm-hmm. So, just kind of diving a little bit deeper into her chart again here. Um, so she's, I mentioned briefly about the North Node also in this, uh, included in this eighth house. It's in this helium. It's actually one degree conjunct this Uranus. And the North Node is pointing us towards growth. It's where we're trying to get to. Where we're coming from, there's another point in the chart directly across, obviously, from that, which is called the South Node. 
the south node is where we come from and some say that's our past lives and that's how we connect to our past life and past life information is through the south node so we can see that growth um into the into new way of being uh this new healing technique this new uh way of talking to our higher mind uh, was something that she was completely focused on. So this north node, which is a very integral part in our chart, was part of this stellium. So that was pretty exciting when I saw that there as well. Yeah. Also, uh, it's retrograde. So does that have any... They're all all retrograde. Oh, all they? nodes. Okay. Yeah, the nodes move. The, move. the nodes actually move the opposite direction to the planets. So, right. but there's... yeah. They're very slow moving, though. They take 30 years to move around the chart. Um, And she was a very nodal person in the sense that when I looked at future events that happened uh, in Dolores' life, the nodes were often involved. So um, this this node being so integral in this eighth house and in this stellium, the nodes were very active. So, you know, um, the karmic aspect of it. Uh, you know, dealing with karma, dealing with people getting caught up in karma, um, dealing with growth, you know, forward and letting go of past. This was very, very much a part of her life. And it shows very, very much in her chart as as being very integral to that experience. Well, isn't that interesting? Because, of course, it, you know, until the latter part of her teaching and, and life. I mean, she she was um, known for Dolores Cannon's method of past life regression. And she talked about karma, you know, all the way up until till the end. Of course, towards the end, she was talking about the, the, the fact that, you know, much of karma and the concept of karma is being released and everything. But how interesting is that? I mean, she made her whole life's work about that. Yeah, I, I thought it was incredibly fascinating that it was so interesting. Sometimes the nodes are really active in somebody's chart, and sometimes they're not. And for her, it, it they're just they're embedded in everything she did. It was you know revolving around these nodes. The other thing was the Pluto. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about her Pluto because it is um, in. Uh, it kind of leads into other things that we're going to talk about. Pluto is. Our it's it's um it's a very collective planet. It's very very slow moving. So lots of us, you know, share the same. It has all of our you know Pluto will have the same script for, um, you know, a whole generation. It's a generational planet where it shows up in the chart is individual, obviously, and the connections it makes to other planets is very personal. So the Pl- the Pluto itself represents power and control it represents the ego and i know one thought uh, one thought that you had was how was she able to separate herself from um you know from uh uh negativity or you know uh, all the things that she was experienced you know experienced in the work that she did because there would be um depression and darkness that would you know that people she's trying to deal with other people and how do you deal with all that i really feel that her pluto being so connected to this really really fantastic jupiter certainly helped um helped her with uh, the jupiter's exalted remember so he's in he's in special um he has a special strength that he carries and um so it's like how do you separate yourself from ego, like from becoming egotistical or having ego, you know, kind of hanging over your head? Uh, the thing about Pluto is that you have to let go of your ego in order to ha- gain true power. That's the deal. So as soon as you can let go of your ego, then the whole world opens up to you. And you know, the work that she did, obviously you have to let go of the ego just in the work, let alone all of the accolades that come with that. You know, all the people that uh, want to meet you and want to, you know, be close to you and want to learn from you and all that kind of stuff. But that aside, just the work that she did, the the method that she developed is letting go of the ego. So this Pluto was so integral in her learning about 
letting go of the ego, that when you let go of ego, when you let go of control, then you have all the control you desire because we know that it's in your reaction to your environment. You can't change your environment. All you can change is how you uh, interact with your environment, how you deal with your environment, uh, and how you behave you know, within that environment for yourself. You can't change the actual environment that you're in. So I just thought, and also as we develop um, some of this storyline, as we start taking this a little bit further and looking at her chart with um, Nostradamus' chart, uh, we're going to see that this Pluto is very, very integral to her relationship with him as well. You know, being a, being the, the groundbreaker, being the one leading the pack, and yeah. that's exactly what she did. So I think that's why she had to have both the sun and the moon in Aries. Yeah. Okay, well, it's good to know that she's that solid in her yep. um, sign. Good. Yep, yep, for sure. And zero, actually, that's a really good point, too, is that, yeah, she has a zero-degree um, Aries moon. So, and this is like the very beginning of all the signs. Aries is the first sign in the zodiac. It's the sign of spring. It's the first one starting the pack. It's it's like the warrior that rushes to the battlefield and starts cutting heads off and, you know, doing their duty uh, to forge ahead and, and win the battle um, without thinking. You know, they just jump in both feet and, you know, what happens, happens. And at zero, zero degrees, it's like... I don't know if you um, know the tarot cards, but you could um, utilize the Fool card as a zero-degree Aries moon. It's like, you know, when they just step off that cliff, just knowing they're going to be okay, just knowing that there's going to be something there to catch them. They have to have that fearlessness of just jumping into the, the thick of it and knowing they'll be okay, and that's, that's what she did. Well, if there is any way of describing Dolores Cannon, it is fearless. You bet. Fearless, yeah. I yeah. second, third that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, sure. Yeah, so that that's the first thing that jumps out. And and the thing about um, you have a, a you know eighth house um, packed eighth house, uh, you know, and and Candace has uh, planets in the eighth house, and we've looked at other charts that have. Uh, planets in the eighth house. It doesn't mean that you have to have a whole bunch of planets in the eighth house to do QHHT for sure. But what it does mean is that there is some sort of thread, some sort of connection between the work that you're doing and this eighth house. Um, you know, which I mean, it makes sense. You know, it is the house of mysteries. It's the house of death. So, you know, it it uh, does make sense. But to really be able to give that signature, you know, I'd have to look at you know, a, a couple of hundred charts to know for sure if, you know, if the majority of QHHT practitioners actually have eighth house, you know, have the eighth house um, planets. Well, to me, it made sense because uh, of the curiosity. Yes. The will dig deep, you know, and yeah, uh, that yeah. I see myself and definitely Dolores. I mean, you know, the master questioner. She, she mm -hmm. just more curiosity than anybody else I ever know, <laughs> you know. And that's really, um, Aries has that sense of curiosity. That's what drives them forward. That's what takes them to the head of the head of the pack to forge ahead, is that they have this intense curiosity and they have the fire, the passion to, um, to follow the quest. Yeah. And the fearlessness, like you said, and uh, you know, Aries people are so much fun to be around, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Thinking up something new to do. There is never a moment when they can't find something fun to do. So, yeah, very. Absolutely. And I know that Candace had a question about um, uh, the connection to the female goddess that Dolores um, also had. You know, so where where do our connections to our feminine and our masculine uh, come into the to the chart? Now she has a very heavy masculine signature with this stellium. She's got what's called a stellium in the eighth house, which means that there's three planets in the um, in the eighth house in Aries, and her north node is there as well. We'll talk about the nodes in a minute. 
Um, but um, so she has this real masculinity, which probably, you know, in her time period, like knowing when she was born and, um, you know, the sort of the male uh, being dominant at that time, that if you were a woman and you were doing you were you know, ground doing groundbreaking work you certainly had to be strong and that's where she got her strength from and that masculine energy that made her fit in to you know to um to the you know to when to the sort of masculine uh era um but Dolores has a very very beautiful Venus in her chart it's her Venus is in Pisces and for astrologers, anybody who's an astrologer out there, her Venus is exalted. When a planet is exalted, she actually has several exalted planets. You know, we, we shouldn't be surprised. She has several exalted planets. An exalted planet is when it is in a position of power, but it's a special kind of power. When a planet is in rulership, when it's ruling its own sign, when it's really powerful that way, it can be it can be a ruler it can be a nice ruler you know we have nice rulers and we also have dictators you know it can be like the bad boy you know cutting heads off and putting their feet <laughs> up on their desk and drinking beer and you know being badly behaved but when they're exalted it's like a king is visiting another country he's still a king you know he still has that prominence of a king and every you know he's got all of his people around him doing all the things they need to do and he's got his soldiers with him making sure he's okay but he's in somebody else's kingdom so he's actually going to be better behaved so exalted planets uh they say classically um that they are better behaved than and stronger in most cases than um planets that are in rulership so her venus was exalted and that is very very ultra feminine uh, and uh, really would give her that connection to the goddess. Uh, it's also in her seventh house, and the seventh house is about our relationship. It's our house of mirrors is really what I like to call it. It's where we surround ourselves with people that mirror back to us this energy that we're trying to learn, this energy that we're trying to um, embrace in ourselves. So she would uh, surround herself with you know many goddesses which you know you could see in her classes she had many goddesses that would uh, come to her class and um and this would be her mirror in how she would grow and understand her own femininity and embrace that hmm. so i just thought that was really interesting when you had asked about her masculine feminine energy and how that might show up that's really that is interesting because her presentation was you know, she was an imposing woman. She was not very delicate at all. Um, mm-hmm. She she would walk into a room and uh, just take command. She wasn't small either. You know, physically she wasn't small, and her her voice was deep. And um, you know, again, she wasn't delicate. But how interesting is that? That you know, there's that there's the play, and then um, then the connection with the divine feminine, which we all know is what's, you know, coming back into um, into our world right now and into our time. But I would like to, to mention here uh, her hands. Have, did, have you ever looked at her hands? And she used them, you know, you could see them. She had the most beautiful hands, very delicate fingers. For And I always, they always captured my attention. Yes. When I was watching her. Yes. And I wonder if somehow that has something to do with it. You know, and that's how her beauty, well, uh, her beauty uh, in one physical way uh, really shone through. Gosh, Marilyn, what a beautiful observation. I, I've i never heard anyone actually say that out loud, even though I've noticed it myself. I mean, some of the most compelling photographs of Dolores and her most compelling gestures are when she would bring her hands to her face. Yeah, yeah. And... Uh, I don't know. I notice hands. I don't know why, but I do. I don't. I don't know if Tamara does, but I've always noticed that she's got a person who has a thin uh, fingertips. Is a very sensitive person. This is how you. Re- I don't know much about reading hands, but this is the one thing I know that notes a, a very person who's very sensitive. Hmm. So, in even though she said she always said she wasn't. 
psychic or it, you know anything like that. I believe that maybe she was receiving <laughs> more information than what she's telling us. You bet. Yes, and actually talking about her, we did. Yeah. Yeah, I can I went down for a visit uh, to San Diego, and then now uh, no, I think we met in uh, Dallas, and then we traveled over to Fayetteville, didn't we? Yeah, that's and then correct. To your place, yeah, and we practiced. Yeah. yeah. Now, ladies, I have to ask you this: Was that in the summer? Was that a summertime class? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yep. You know, what what? April. April. Oh. oh okay. I I see um I was there for the summertime um classes but I I don't think it was April but okay. Well, anyway, I'm so happy to have you both here. I think you were Candace. Really? I don't remember you, but I remember Dolores at the end of the class said, we, "Now listen, we don't hang you up to dry." <laughs> remember she used to say that. Yeah. And she says, we've got this, uh, you know, this person has, has set up this whole uh, forum and where you can ask questions. Yeah, that was the old Yahoo forum. It and I think you were there at the back of the class. You might not have been there for the whole class. I yeah, think. no. She, yeah, she didn't, she didn't let me stay for the whole class that quickly. I had to prove my, <laughs> I had to have a year or two to prove myself. But thank you for, for that lovely that lovely memory, and, and Tamara and Marilyn and I are part of this amazing worldwide community of other practitioners, and we've been sharing, you know, hundreds if not thousands of stories and concepts and ideas now for, um, well, gosh, for, for seven years. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it would be seven years. Yeah, <laughs> it's been quite a while. Well, let's just jump right into all of this, shall we? Uh, you know, the first thing I'd like to ask is, um, you know, all I know, Marilyn, is you you said, how about we do a show like this? So how did the idea come to you? Um, I think uh, because I, this is years ago, I got uh, Dolores's, somebody on the forum, I think, actually posted Dolores's birth information. And I, I looked up her chart and I thought, oh, well, that's interesting, you know. And then, but I'm not for sure it was the right information. And then recently I looked again and I thought, holy cow, she's an eighth house sun sign. Isn't that, because I'm an eighth house sun sun sign. And then I started, uh, you know, I was talking a little bit to Tamara on that. And then you asked me if I'd like to be on. And I don't know, you know, I I was looking for ideas that would be interesting. And then maybe it was Dolores. But for whatever reason, I thought, wow, wouldn't it be fun to have Tamara on talking about Dolores's uh, chart? And then that's when I uh, we got your um, your uh, birth information, and I said to Tamara, Tamara, and I think I said to you too, wouldn't it be a hoot if Candace had an eight thousand sun sign? And there you are. You know, I need to ask that. I know that Tamara wasn't quite ready to talk about this quite yet, but, I mean, is that, I mean, how many sun signs are there? I mean, is the odds really, really high for that then? 12, and I don't know what the odds are. Maybe Tamara can still listen. Okay, so so we have to kind of step back just a little tiny bit to, to be able to talk about the houses because that's kind of where you get into more advanced. So what we need to know, first of all, is that when we're looking at an astrology chart, we're looking at it on a 2D piece of paper, or like it's a 2D piece of paper, you've got this print on it, and you've flattened out the night sky on this piece of paper. And astrology is a symbolic language. So when you were talking about um, me being able to uh, read and interpret um, symbols and symbology, that's really what we're doing. It's like... Uh, whether you're looking at the mandala of the uh, chart or whether you're looking at dream, you know, interpretation, it's all a symbolic interpretation. So the chart itself is like taking a snapshot of the sky at the moment of the person's birth and putting it it out on this piece of paper so that we can symbolically glean information about ourselves uh, you know, it's, it, 
really for further growth. We, we want to look at this. It's nice to have all this information, but what do you do with it? Well, there's skilled and unskilled behavior. So as you are symbolically interpreting the information, getting deeper into aspects of your psyche, you can then look at skilled and unskilled behavior and hopefully bring that into your day-to-day existence and work with that. So looking at the moment of your birth, the the um, sign on the horizon is called your uh, rising sign, your ascendant sign. So that's like if you were looking at the horizon, it, there's obviously this big mathematical calculation that happens, but we'll say, you know, you're standing out there, you're looking out the window at the moment of your birth, and this sign is on there. And the sign is the script. It's, it's planets are utilizing as their script, how they're functioning. So, you know, you have an actor and this actor's given this script and they have to try to act out their part with this script. And the script tells us all kinds of things about behaviors that are going to come up with, you know, with each of the planets. So then we divide it into all of these houses. We now have this starting point where we can do 12 houses and the 12 houses Um, represent different areas of our life and what you guys are talking about is the eighth house um, and that is the house of mysteries (laughs) yeah it's the house of (laughs) it's it's actually the house of death as well and um, and some say rebirth Um, so it's it's exactly what you're doing in QHHT you're looking at you're going sort of between the veil looking at uh, punching a hole in time and l- going back into lives and um, and gleaning information from those lives, looking at death and uh, and you know interpreting that and and um, symbolically gaining information that helps you live a better life. So that having uh, prominent planets, not just the sun sign but also the moon sign. Dolores actually has bo- had both of her sun. And the moon sign of the day of her birth, you know, this this day that she had, was were, they were both in Aries. So they were both utilizing the Aries script, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but they were both in the eighth house of uh, mysteries. And I, I don't know if I'm getting off topic here right away, but I'm just, I have a question <laughs> about her moon. Because yes. it's zero degrees, it's right on yes. the house. So she could have very easily been a Pisces moon. And I, I'm just, you know, knowing her a little bit that I know her, and I, you can just probably be able to add a lot more. I wonder what, you know, how she would have been different as a Pisces moon. Uh, well, it would it would have been very different, actually. And I did because, you know, because we, we don't have her time on a birth certificate. Her time is from memory. Um, and it's actually on Astro dot, uh, the Astro Data Bank on Astro.com um, where I confirmed time because you had um, found this birth uh, birth time on I think on on one of the um, forums and I wanted to make sure that we did have the right birth time and it is the one that's listed there that Dolores has given somebody from memory so it's like her mother remembered that you know the time or an aunt remembered the time. And this is the time that we've um, we've gone with, um, and so I did move her time back and forth to see if that moon would switch. But that whole day, uh, it is an Aries moon, so we know that no matter what, even if we move the chart to um, you know two thirty or one thirty or you know different times, that we're still getting this really strong, powerful um, Aries moon. And I think that Dolores had to have the sun and the moon both in Aries to be able to do the work that she did. I think if it was a Pisces moon, um, uh, maybe it, she wouldn't have been as focused. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. You know, the Aries, the Aries moon and the Aries sun really tells us that she was a pioneer in her field. That's, you know, it's, uh, it's a cardinal fire uh, sign. Uh, Aries, and it's very much about, um, 